Welcome to a new episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Hinson, joined by Dan Tack again. Hey, I'm here again. My good lord. I'm, I've got regular glasses this week. Thank <laughs> Christ. We also have Brian Shea here. Hey, everyone. Welcome. It's a it's a three-man show. Yeah, this what's, is, what's the deal? doing it? It's an intimate ordeal. The rest of the Game Informer office is empty. We're also recording this early, doing, uh, doing weird scheduling conflicts and whatnot. But we're here to talk about games. We have so much to cover. We're talking about For Honor. Ubisoft's big game, which we talked a little bit about last week. There's an interview. I believe that was last week. Uh, then we're talking about, help me out, Shay, Sniper Elite V4. Sniper Elite 4. There's no V. No V. <laughs> there the used v to be a V? The V is silent. Was there a V? There was a 2. I think had a V2. Oh, this is like too fast, too furious. Who can keep this stuff straight? Uh, talking <laughs> a little bit about MLB. Uh, MLB The Show 17. And Thank you, Shay. And then we have some great community emails. Who knows if Shay's still going to be here or not? I won't he might be. Disappear into the ether. After all that, we're talking to a Brian Shea favorite, Alex Regopoulos. Oh, the founder, uh, now creative director overall for Harmonix. So we look back in his career, talk about like the most exciting times in Harmonix's history. Talk about the classic feud with Guitar Hero and Rock Band, which I'm sure you've read a lot about and thought a lot about, Brian Shea. I think about it every night. I know you do. We also talk about. Most importantly, producing Beatles Rock Band, one of the greatest games of the last generation. And then the core of the interview, the entire framework for the thing is, what the hell does the future look like for a studio like Harmonix? Mm -hmm. Where are they making their money? Where are they placing their bets? What does a big independent studio like that do in today's bizarre video game climate? Uh, so I even talked to him about what the future looks like, including <laughs> the idea of like just attaching a musical twist on certain genres. I bring up the idea of a musical MOBA, to which he responds with this. That sounds pretty appealing. It's something we've specifically talked about on a number of occasions. It's a very steep proposition. Like what you're bringing to the category has to be so strong. It can't be like, oh, we make the game 20% better because there's an interactive music element. It has to be like 200 times better if what you're going to do is unseat an established titan in a mature in a mature genre. So that's the back half of the show. So stay tuned if you like harmonics or just want to hear from an intelligent guy who's been in the industry for a long time now. Did you ask him about that weird like failed first person shooter? We talk about Chroma. Yeah, yeah. that that was like a rhythm take on uh, FPSs, right? Which is a bizarre idea. It's basically if Lucio was an entire game from Overwatch. Um, we talk <laughs> about that. He says it's not quite as dead as you may think. Really? Yeah. I want to hear more, so nice I'm going to check out the back half of the show. I love you, Dan Tech. But for now, <laughs> we're talking about For Honor. Jeff Cork uh, is at home reviewing For Honor right now. He wasn't sure quite is. ready since we're recording this a little bit early, but we've all played a little bit. So these impressions, mm -hmm. incomplete, Certainly. not final verdict, but first hour or two with For Honor. I played a little bit of the beta and then played the, the full game last night. Dantec, I am most curious about your take on For Honor. So I was I was pretty much saving myself for this experience, the full experience. No beta play whatsoever. Ah. Went into it for about two hours. Uh, you know, as you know, there were no advanced review copies of this game. Everyone's playing at the same time. I think that's yeah. mostly because of, you know, the nature of this game. It's sort of an online only uh, battle royale with many different teams and opponents, all these working parts. It's an online game. Even not to play the single player, you have to be connected to the I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't played the single player. Well, you but, do, uh, because in order to start get past the start screen, it made me log into my Uplay account or Ubisoft okay. account. Okay, is that right? Okay. Well, there you go. So, yeah, it's an online-only game. I'm used to this on the PC scene. Pretty much everything I get is, like, you know, launch day. That's when you play, right? So that's not any different for me. I was really curious about this game. Melee combat games are generally very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, I'd heard a lot of, you know, noise about it. Well, it's invented by, like, you know, like, have you played this, Dan? Is it, like... You know, that one game I don't want to mention. Is it like that? Melee it's a Dark Souls clone, right? That's what I hear. <laughs> and you know what? I, I'm happy to announce. No, it is not. Um, uh -huh. So I've gotten about a couple hours in this game under my belt. Mm -hmm. I need more. Probably around 10 more before I could make any kind of analysis. But certainly have impressions. Please. Have impressions. What is your top of the line impression? Dan? So right off, the, right off the bat, I'd say it takes you at least an hour to even get your hands on the combat. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think it's too complex, but it's definitely got a lot going to it. Really? See, I was resisting this. It seems like that's the big takeaway. It is seems... everyone saying it's, oh, it's compl it's complicated. I understand, like... It seems easy in the tutorial when you're playing Absolutely. as bots, but against other people trying to manage all the blinking and all the... Every effect at the same time, like, is he going to attack high and I have to parry that while I've got an incoming attack from the left that I also need to stop somehow? Should I just try to dodge this? There's many, many decisions you need to make on the fly. And if, you, and if you make a mistake, you're dead. 
combat is brutal. Like it's, it's over and decided pretty quick. Yeah. But I, I understand there's a lot of details about what skills you have equipped and different mm-hmm. abilities and stuff like that. You'll see like flashing green or different flashes on the yes. battlefield. It's like, I don't know what that is yet. But outside of that, I think the core combat is remarkably well, simple. The core combat is you want to stick a sword or an axe or, or a spear <laughs> in your head. You're either blocking or attacking three directions. No, no. Light, come on. heavy. That's really? The, that's at the basis level. But okay, you've got to factor in dodging and block mm-hmm. bashing. Uh, guard blocks, throws. Those guard blocks are tricky. Is that right, Brian Shay? You just ran. Th- we did a duel last night, and that is how he destroyed me. Is I had no idea how to handle a guard block, and he just kept pushing me off ledges and like <laughs> knocking me down and just I wish driving I his axe into me. It was uh, it was a magical time. Real quick for this detour, uh, it finally roped Brian Shea into play. Just a quick one v one. Like Brian Shea was hired as the fighting game master, so I figured this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be a slaughter out of the gate. We battle in the shipyards, right? I think I'm a Viking. He's mm-hmm. a cool knight guy. Yeah, we're, I'm like a knight, and you're. Yeah. We're ready to go. Within minutes, my Viking had him tackled to the ground, and we're just repeatedly stabbing him <laughs> in the face. <laughs> I next have no round, answer. next round, Brian Shea was trying to run away and hide. He kept running around this pillar. I trying thought you to were dodge running me. for me. No, he was running for me. It was like a Looney Tunes cartoon. <laughs> it really was Ring Around the Rosie. It really was. And then eventually, was the ring saw. stopped, and he was the Parker full of posy, meaning he's dead. <laughs> Uh, it was a slaughter, and afterwards he's like, how do you keep doing that? How can you keep blocking me or, like, bashing through my block? Yeah, I asked you, like, I sent you a text. I'm like, how do you <laughs> deal with the guard block? And you're just like, I have no idea. You dodge, or you or you hit them while they're doing the guard block. Well, that's what I eventually learned. But... That's right. But it was really a masterpiece and just a slaughter, This Brian was my, Shea. besides the tutorial, that was my very first experience <laughs> with the game. Sure. And Hanson just annihilated me. Oh, it could not have made me happier. <laughs> so, again, I, I think you're right in oh, some well. ways. Yeah. To get back to the point here, uh-huh. I I think it is more complex than like you know just smashing and stabbing. It's not a hack and slash by any stretch. Uh, I think there's a lot more to it than that, and it will take it will take time with the game to understand that. Like if you go out into combat, and be like, "There's a knight, I'm gonna kill him," and then you're like, "What happened? I'm dead," you know, because that that will happen. It takes. I a do, but hours. I just I I. I don't want to have people not try out this game if they're interested in it because they hear that it's complicated. They imagine it's like a I, MOBA or something. Like oh, there's sure. not. I'm sure it's deep, but it does not take too long to understand the basics at all. Oh, I agree with yeah. that. Okay. Absolutely. I'm just saying, don't expect to be, you know, the hero of the day by just mashing a button. <laughs> so when you were playing, where is it mostly like the Dominion mode? Uh, I tried a lot of the, what's it, the skirmishing. So okay. trying to take points back and forth, getting getting the score. I've tried both the score game and the Dominion mode. Okay. Uh, and what, so what was the biggest learning curve in those modes? What did you learn to appreciate? Finding the, the right positions to attack people. So like I've tried a couple classes now. So I tried the knight who has like uh, the the big guard, which can guard from every direction, and he hits like a monster truck when he does hit. So he's fun. He's simple. He's good for a new player, I think. And then the character I'm gravitating to is the character that doesn't really block a whole lot, the berserker, because it has like a reduced block time. Like if I if I tap up on block, it only lasts for a couple seconds. And which Ooh. which field which region is oh, the this berserker is this from? is the Viking or the Norse? Because okay. you know Mr. Hansen said we should play Vikings. So it's the only. Choice. I know you can play. You can by the way you can play characters from any pool. Regardless of your faction. That's so just you start this wars. game, the entire conceit of this game is that it's these three different factions. We mm-hmm. talked about it a bit last week, and they've been at war for thousands of years. Yeah. Over a puddle of water, right? I love Over it. Over one puddle I love of water. it. Why not? Go for it. But it's a little <laughs> this, bit strange. I mean, it's a game about Vikings with samurai and knights fighting. Let's. Who cares how it started, right? This is, I get the concept. It's, it's great, right? At times like, it takes itself a little too seriously as far as like... Does it really? Well, like panning and scanning Ken Burns style over a map talking about some lore. I, lo- I love it. Like if you're going to do this, you go, you go full... Right, you yeah. go full on. I'm into the absurdity of it. I just want to learn location names in the For Honor universe. I'm sure. not going to read a stupid <laughs> comic book about Okay, well stuff. done. I don't either. All right, but anyways, uh, where I was going with that is in the beginning, it makes you choose between, you know, mm-hmm. if you want the Vikings, if you want the Knights, if you want the Samurai, Bushido, all that stuff. But then it seems like the choice does not really have an impact. It's like, well, you can choose any does. character you want. It doesn't affect gameplay. It just affects some stats in the larger meta game. It, certainly. And the larger sure. meta game is super cool in this. I think that's what's going to ha- give the game legs if it, if it ends up having them. As right. We don't, can't tell after one day. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the whole faction war I think is super cool. It's the multiplayer aspect of things. Like you're going to want to, wa- you're warring with the other two factions, pushing in their territories, laying down resources, all kinds of really cool, fun meta stuff. Like outside of each individual game. And I think it's really important that they do let you play every class outside of the game because not all the classes are like one to one. Like the knights don't have counter attack heavy or something like that. They might, but I'm saying like not every every uh, faction has this is a special skills, right? Like they've, everything has its own unique abilities, and that has to be open to everybody to have fairness in any kind of competitive meta game. 
Uh, yeah, even what, though it is weird from a, from that standpoint, but it, I think it would be incredibly boring for them to just be like, "All right, the knights, the Vikings, and the samurai all have the same stuff," so that way that way it's all even, right? Instead, right. they can create more classes and let everybody just play whatever the heck they want. It seems I think the core idea is fun, like we mentioned. The meta game it starts to get a more a little more complicated, but it seems like a like a murky game just digging through menus it kind of has that ubisoft uh, just layering on features and features and different currencies like what i know i know what you're talking i know what you're here? talking about there yeah. and i don't and i don't think this game has less of it than some other ubisoft games that i've played certainly not mm-hmm. um certainly not yeah oh, it's just okay. confusing like the, the steel angle and you can use steel as a currency and you mm-hmm. can give yourself a, a championship status equipment. for a certain amount of time yeah, to I get want, like want, double xp let's it's talk just, about the game first before we please, talk about these mechanics. there's a lot of murkiness but the core of it i think is really intriguing it is intriguing and i want us to know if it works in the longer time period for the two hours i played i was getting a real sense of like this is the opening of gladiator you know where it's just like that one guy comes out and starts screaming Askahunda, uh-huh. right and you're just like chopping off limbs and hacking off parts finishing moves like i was like whoa i am into this right like dan this was is... whispering Oscar Hunda and i was microphone. i was like i was like dude let me go <laughs> let me go throw a gladiator on the other tv i need uh-huh. to get into this right like or, i need to get distracted and or get just into like this. you know the best parts of like braveheart massive battles just like just limbs flying everywhere yeah and then you like randomly meet up with one of your teammates and just like sandwich some little samurai guy in a corner and chop his head off that's fun there's amazing <laughs> moments that can be set up in this game just like uh you know, you're taking over different objectives, trying to hold it and stuff, mm-hmm. and everyone gets so focused. I mean, this was super early on. I'm sure strategy is going to evolve and whatnot, but some of the objective points were just wide open. Uh-huh. So, like, I would climb up this tower and just take point C. And it's like, well, no one else is up here. Right, well, and then I would just sit in this tower and just wait. And I felt like yep. the lone knight at the end of Last Crusade or something. <laughs> like, when somebody comes in here, this is going to be a slaughter. And then... Coming around the side, there's like this samurai little bastard. So I start like this one-on-one duel, and these duels are really impactful and really fun. And just when I just about got him, he pulled the Velociraptor, and the other samurai guy came around from the side. <laughs> right. like, now I have to take on two, but it is totally possible, it's possible to block in the perfect way and to pull it off. And that's what I love feeling. You're going like, yeah. to see some really amazing stuff happen. Like It'll be very gifable as as you watch some insane moves happen. Absolutely. Um, when we were playing last night, I totally pulled that move where I was just like everybody was battling for B, and I was like, I don't think anybody's over on A at all. <laughs> so I just like kind of sprinted over there, and nobody was there, and I held it for like you know two minutes, and then two people came over and, and killed me. And I think some of that's just because it's day one matchmaking. Everyone's level one. No one knows what the heck's going yeah, on. It was the same thing with oh, Overwatch, yeah. right? Everyone's trying to play. Day one, everyone's like, this is deathmatch, FPS, right? Let's just play that. And that's what everyone's looking at right now. And I'm not comparing it to the brilliance that is Overwatch, but it has that certain feel, too, where it's it's a thrill playing Overwatch just because there's so much personality and whatnot, even though you've played game modes that are like that before. And this, it's just, I've played Hold the Objective hold the objective for so much you know so much time in games before but just knowing that i will not get picked off by archers by anybody sure with a will. gun i mean the range attacks are awesome i, I wait what there's range attacks one of my I, favorite like the things catapult I've so seen, i've been playing but... the berserker right so okay. after you after you might land my my heart attack my hard swipe which i can do like three in a row uh-huh. that's like almost a full kill because my character is so offensively oriented and then they start running and you just grab my axe throw it in his back as he's running and just kill him it's freaking Ooh, amazing i haven't seen that i Ooh. think i think one of the samurai has a bow as well it's one of my really? special modes oh modes, yeah. wow okay like these are there's a cool long cooldown right yeah. but like they're great they're they're really fun and like it's a great way to pick off that guy because i'm sure what you've seen i've seen this a couple times where there's one guy one of my games it was just hilarious all he would do was run like he would not actually engage anybody he'd just run past people try to get their attention and you get like three guys chasing him that don't know how to stop him but there are power-ups around the map to help prevent that, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. the catapult power-up. It reminds me of, like, Meteor from Age Mythology, which, you know, we're big fans of. Dan yes. can't win a single it's your game favorite, to save his it's, life. It's the only ability you know how to use in that game. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so great when you see a large, uh, you know, it's just, it's the um, it's the creep. It's just the nonsense soldiers running towards you mm-hmm. and whatnot. Um, but then just launching that catapult, which is basically a meteor strike into the heart of it. It's so satisfying. And those are the abilities that I'm still a little bit cagey and wary on. I don't understand. Yeah, right. I'm and not there's, there's lots of abilities because every yeah. class has its own unique skills, right? And I'm not talking just the active and passive abilities that you learn as you earn, like as you level up in a game. Yeah, they've got a whole like different move of combo list, mm-hmm. different specific abilities. Like I said, my berserker has like a reduced block, where if I tap up on block, it only lasts like a second because I'm not designed to be in there blocking. I'm designed to be. If I'm in, I'm getting in, right? I'm, I'm dodging or attacking. So no, Matt Miller also isn't here. There's a whole list of people that aren't here. But Matt Miller uh, played a lot of the beta, and he really, really enjoyed this game. And my critique that I brought up to him is 
I like the one-on-one -on -one combat a lot. I like the duels. I like just slaughtering Brian Shea in a shipyard. Well, again everyone and again loves and that. Again. He kept sending me Snapchats just of his face frowning. It was a constant bar barrage. But what I brought up to him is there's something really bizarre about the feeling of just Dynasty warriors in your way through all these peons. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. Dynasty Warriors. No, Come on. Just I, played for, a I love Dynasty Warriors. I played I do a lot too. of Dynasty I do Warriors. Too, just for as far as the creep goes, just the random nonsense soldiers that you're killing. And then suddenly mm -hmm. it's like, why am I actually getting hurt now? Oh, there's one actual guy yep. hidden in that you mist. You need to pay attention to that. Yeah. You do. And I guess in the early hours, it just feels bizarre to just basically be running through the ocean. And then all of a sudden you realize there's a brick wall in there. Is that a. That's a terrible analogy, but you know what I mean. It's, 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 it's not either, great. It's either all or nothing. Either it's like you have to worry about it to the, you know, nth degree, or it's just a sea of peons that you can just. I mean, honestly, right through. I've st I mean, I don't know if this is a correct mover yet. As I said, only a couple hours in, I just stopped paying attention to little guys completely, pretty much at this stage. Yeah. Like they don't, they do give you the one point or whatever, but it's so much more important to get that kill on a player. So. So you're just hunting down the other players, right? Especially since I'm a zerker, I get more life. And everything when I get a kill. Okay. And I love the executions. Those are a lot of fun, right? Those give you. I think I think those give everybody stamina health back, right? If you if you pull one off. Yeah, you have to finish them with a heavy blow, and then you get to do a Mortal then you Kombat esque. Can do, yes. And I don't even yeah. like fatalities in Mortal Kombat. I don't like gore at all. But in this game, it feels deserved. I like how they're ta they're tailored to the classes and the the style that they would have been doing real executions in in their era. If, yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I don't know about that. I mean, my guy throws a sword <laughs> up in the air, grabs the blade with their hands, and then digs the like the base of the blade into their neck. Weren't you like, there? That's historical. Yeah, that's the great grandfather really Shay. <laughs> I think he went that way. It was very sad. His, <laughs> your grandmother had to watch him. Dear God. So the setup for this game, you talk about like the overhead map and the different tactics yes. and whoever's in charge of the maps, like the look of the map will change based on mm -hmm. different factions, all that stuff, which is a cool idea. Do you get any RTS vibes from the whole thing? No. I think it's just a really nice way to set up I think this is how it went down, and obviously yeah. this is straight up hypo hypothetical conjecture. I love it, please. But it's like we so we've got this multiplayer only game. People hate that, right? We need we need something. We need an overarching yeah. structure here. Give people a sense of purpose in their thing. You can't just do a season like everybody's doing seasons and ladders, right? What if we do this cool like uh, you know power struggle of war, you know, between the factions? We already got the factions. Mm -hmm. That's a cool idea. What do we do? Oh, cool! They get unique loot and they get uh, all this other kind of stuff for winning a season. And it the, seems fun. And the map changes forever, like you know, based on what happens. Yeah, that's super cool. Mm -hmm. I love that concept. And it's it's definitely a game, and this says a lot, I think, in terms of with the main menu, what's on top. Multiplayer is on top. They want to funnel you towards that. This is a, okay. We can. I haven't played the story content. Maybe yeah. it's amazing, but come on, this is a multiplayer game. It is. Whether there's story so. content there or not, which which there is, I haven't touched it, but like. This is a multiplayer-centric game through and through. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Shay, you started story content, too, Yeah, I right? played uh, two missions. I think I'm in the exact same boat. It feels... It is a multiplayer-focused game. I think they wanted to have the message of, there's there's totally a campaign here. There's totally a campaign mm. here. Uh, it feels north of Titanfall 1's campaign. <laughs> it uh, sure does. North of Battlefront's, south of Battlefield 1's. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say that. Okay, it's somewhere in that range where it's like, it seems like certainly multiplayer assets, it's not like you're wandering through and having a story-heavy experience. They try and pack as, pack as much personality as they can into characters that can be interchangeable. Yeah, it's the characters that, like, so far I've only played, like, the, the one character in the two missions, and it's totally not memorable whatsoever, like the character themselves. Although, uh, mine was voiced by Jennifer Hale. Oh, whoa. So, hey, not there too shabby there. Whoa. Spare no expense. <laughs> uh, and they just do like little quirky personality things like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, we need the great warrior knight to stand up and fight. And it's going to be you, Jennifer Hale Knight. And she goes, Oof. all right, then I guess it's me. <laughs> like little like kind of, I love it. Hey, I got some punchy personality yeah. here. <laughs> but it's not like a very focused character study by any means. It's basically. We're going to have some VO that'll guide you through these multiplayer maps. It is it is more than that from what I've seen, but don't expect the full Monty single-player campaign. Mm -mm. Uh, are you intrigued by the story at all, Shay? Not the story, but I'm, I'm definitely going to make my way through all the, the story missions. Like I think I'm going to go all the way to the end unless it really drops off. Um, there was another mission that I played at E3, I guess this past year, that was pretty fun, where you're the Vikings. And it... Uh, it seems like there's some cool stuff they do, but yeah, it does. It, it seems like it's primarily just getting you familiar with like 
the combat system for multiplayer. Yeah, for sure. And they seem to want you to replay the missions too. There's a big screen that says like, hey, you earn story experience to increase your story level by playing and replaying missions. Have at it, everybody. I got to check that out. Yeah, don't you want that hot story level? If it, I, gets, if it gets me a cool skin <laughs> or unlock or something, yeah. They're big on cosmetics and it seems to be pushing that direction. Mm-hmm. It seems like a little bit of a wasted opportunity and maybe it's just I like the old Warcraft games, but it seems like a simple hook for the story would be like, having a faction because you start out with the knights and I think you move on to the Vikings and then the samurai I think are the third chapter. So that's what I that's why I thought of RTS comparison, right? And I, I wanted it. that experience of like having the knights interact with the Vikings, but it in the first to second mission, you're going from fighting the knights to the Vikings and it's just kind of this unceremonious, we've got to kill these Vikings now. But I wanted like this, <laughs> who is this strange exotic horde? Who are these oh, people? I want some sort of like cultural Haven't interaction. they been fighting for a thousand years? Well, yeah. yeah there was this pool of water. All right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, and why not start at the start then? Why not start the campaign first when they start fighting over this three pool honor. of water? Oh yeah, that's yeah. going to be great. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of this game yet. I like the core of it a lot. There's a lot of systems interacting. Do you think this is going to catch on? I mean, I, I can't I can't judge that at this point. I can you say, need to then. I need you to. I really like the two hours I've played. It's it's a unique beast, and yes. I'm interested to see where it goes. I think it'd be super, like, seems like a game you could add on to very easily, like a lot of other multiplayer games do with content. Like, I can see a DLC being a new faction. Like, mm-hmm. a year later, the fourth faction comes in. Who is it? I don't know. It's probably mm-hmm. badass, but like, you know. It pirates. seems to be... Pirates. Pirates oh, of work. of course. Mm-hmm. It's built in a way, and we talked about it in the interview last week with the creative director, it's built in a way that's similar to Rainbow Six Siege. I could see Ubisoft mm-hmm. using that very much as a template about keeping out, like, rolling out new content, having new seasons. It seems like the Siege community is still enjoying and playing that game. Yeah. Um, and it's prepared and built in such a way where I could see it having those kinds of legs. It It definitely has that feeling of this is a $60 game. It feels like if you nudged it another direction, it could have been a free-to-play game. It's this weird but then, middle ground that Ubisoft right. seems to be dancing in. But I think they did the same thing as you know as Overwatch did by saying, yeah. forget that. Everybody can if you do that, then what do they do they do? They have to make they have to make it so you have to buy characters. You don't want to go down that road, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't want to buy the Berserker. I mean, I have to use the in-game currency, but that's not a problem. Yeah, right maybe just, it's just like it's like you you don't want that you don't want to do that in a game that's so based on balance where it's like oh well we changed the crusader this week uh now everyone wants to play the crusader or we've got a new knight coming out he's available for 1099 uh, yeah his sword is twice as big as anybody else's really cool guys come buy him it just yeah there's just this weird trend of 60 dollars games not picking a path and, either go full premium or full free to play, and this weird middle ground is where it's I just know. distressing. I see what you're coming at, but at the same time, I think you know people just assume that this just because it's a multiplayer centric experience doesn't mean it should be free to play. I'm not saying that. All I'm right. just saying eh, lose the six different types of currencies and boosts and all this stuff. Unlocking hey, characters. You'll never see me currency. argue. You know, sure. Yeah. Okay. I so in the interview last week that we posted a lot of people commented like i don't know why you think ubisoft just pulled this game out of nowhere they're clearly just trying to get that chivalry money uh sure. do you see a comparison are you familiar with the chivalry series i'm familiar i'm familiar with it not amount of super hardcore into where i am but i have okay. played the titles yeah i mean the melee action combat game of the feudal era is certainly a thing that has been certainly there's more than one it's not just chivalry there's a couple contenders out there on yeah. pc uh and they have been they've been around for ages and many iterations um I don't know if this is just that trying to... It doesn't seem like me as it's just like, oh, we got to get some of that chivalry dollar. It doesn't seem like that to me. And if it did seem like that to me, I would say it. Although I looked um, up chivalry on uh, Steam Spy. Yeah. 4.4 million copies. It's a it's a, wow. it's a a significant PC game. I'm sure it was sure. a bullet point somewhere in some meeting within Ubisoft. Like, oh, it's not a bad comparison. Maybe we could kind of corner that market I a just, little. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like they're... I mean, yeah. But that's just like saying, like, you know, all shooters are just taking from other shooters yeah Yeah, but the market of like deliberate melee combat in medieval era Mm -hmm. is not exactly overflowing i I don't know how to look this is faster than i thought it was going to be i thought it was going to be more meted out more soulsy if you will for the to use a terrible term that you know will come back to bite me i'm sure but more more deliberate and this is very quick deliberate so have you tried the one-on-ones the duels uh, no not yet i Man, am I nuts for loving that as much as I do, Shane? It's fun. I think that it, 
you need to make sure that everybody understands how the combat works first and foremost. Um, I disagree. I recommend everybody send invites out to Brian Shea. Do that. <laughs> and just beat him senseless oh, I with like an this axe. Idea. It's just delightful. This is why I turn notifications off. <laughs> I mean, I want to see where, the, you know, again, two hours in, day one. Totally. I want to see where things go. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. Mm-hmm. I, it, I think production values are really solid. Like even in, you know, the build up cut scenes and outro cut scenes for every story mission. It's like, this is surprisingly well done. Spared no expense with this thing. Yeah, it's really... pretty cool to, to see the, like one person go charge and everybody just runs in. You see like all like the, the minions coming out of nowhere and yeah. kind of backing you up. It's for cool. sure. It's, I mean, you got to give it up to Ubisoft every once in a while for getting weird and backing projects like this. Like this... I feel, I feel like this game, like the combat in it, it feels like there, there is a passion behind it. Like yes. these are carefully curated combat experiences I feel like that guy from like from Ronin, the movie Ronin, that guy with the little samurai soldiers. I think uh-huh. he's the guy who made this game secretly, <laughs> right? Could be. It's it, just like I got that vibe. It's certain. I cannot imagine a world. I who knows what the future looks like for For Honor. I'm really curious to see what the wider internet thinks of this thing and gamers out there. It seems like it's tailor made. Worst case scenario to be a cult classic, one that years from now people will reference like For Honor. That's when the industry was trying some weird stuff. Did you play that game? What was that? That was awesome. <laughs> so it's the next Mirror's Edge. <laughs> that's right mm. and i can't wait for ferrano catalyst it's really going to have an impact on everybody the year it comes out <laughs> i think i like what i've played at ferrano so far uh but we'll right. definitely check in with so, jeff cork once so too early to call more. i can't wait to see what jeff says after x hours of play in comparison to my little wade in the water but that's right. uh i am i'm gonna play some more looking yeah. forward to it yeah hey uh dan Tack, are you ever gonna play sniper elite 4 the answer to that question is no <laughs> Brian Shea, should Dan Tech play Sniper Elite Four? Yeah, it's it's a pretty good shooter. Like it, I, I gave it a seven seven five out of ten, um, which is a full point higher than Tim Turry gave Sniper Elite Three when that came out. Oh, there we go. Um, he gave it a seven. He gave it a six seven five. And you gave this a seven. Seven seven five. Okay. No, I really just I, I wasn't following. <laughs> Seriously, I wasn't trying to like. I really didn't know. I was, didn't know. So the thrill of this game is the dumb X ray shots. That's Not dumb. That's Super like the classy, gimmick of it. gory X-ray it, shots. It's satisfying to see it happen every single time. But like, I think the the thrill of this game is how they handle the the sandbox structure of the missions. So you have, I think it's eight missions to go through, or eight, it's either eight or ten. I'm I'm forgetting right now. But um, they they just kind of dump you in this big open map area, and they're like, all right, well, here are your main objectives, and then over here, there's some secondary objectives, and you can go over here and. You, know, you can destroy these artillery guns if you want. If not, then that's cool too. And then like, it's the most passive general I've ever heard. Yeah, it's <laughs> but do what makes you feel good, soldier. Basically, yeah. you're helping out the resistance in Italy, um, and you can do different objectives, and you get experience based on that, and then level up your player card. But like being able to kind of look at the map and then mark an objective and be like, all right, well, this is the one I have to do. This is the other one I have to do, and then like kind of map like, oh, well, if I go this way, I can take care of this objective and this objective as well. It's kind of cool the way it lets you like decide the route you want to take to the objectives, the the way you want to take on those objectives. Like obviously it gears you towards sniping things and sniping people, but like you're perfectly competent with an SMG or a shotgun or a pistol. So yeah. like you can sneak into like a camp and just take everyone out with a silenced pistol and then kind of move on or but like the stealth feels good, moving from one objective to the next feels good after you've mapped out and like and if you get like caught in a firefight, you are perfectly capable of fighting your way out of that. How many times did you do a Tiger Woods like fist like yeah after a crazy sniper shot? Um, maybe like twenty or twenty, 20 times. times. No, there, there, there's some definitely <laughs> like satisfying moments in that game. Um, I think the first few times I was like, oh, that was pretty cool, and then like you know the novelty wears on you, but it's still yeah. like even on the last mission, I'm doing like, a headshot and. I'm like, oh, I, I, it didn't give me the slow slow motion kill cam. I, that that kind of sucks. But it, it's like it's not like, you know, the first few times you're like, oh, that's really cool. Like the level of detail that they have, like there's like a, it shows like the X-ray of the person's body that you're shooting, and it shows like the bullet entering in slow motion, and it's like, all right, it went through his lung, and you just see his lung like deflate, <laughs> and it's it's really really gory. Um, I think my best kill that was on the video that we posted on GameInformer.com hey, and YouTube. Check it out. Um, was I sniped this guy and it like went through his midsection. It didn't x-ray and I was like, well, why did it go slow motion? And then I saw that what happened was the bullet exited his stomach, hit like an explosive barrel and then exploded right in his face and like the x-ray went then. So like it showed like the explosion was just, you know, destroying his skeleton. (laughs) (laughs) This sounds really cool. 
Yeah. So what's wrong with this game? Dan Tech, is that sarcasm? I don't know, man. Like, am I so... Is it weird? Like, this is... Oh, wow. It's right. just... It's sniper porn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is what I mean, it, it is. It really That's, is, yeah. Is there... What's wrong with it? So the, uh, the, the checkpointing system really kind of got to me. Uh-huh. Um, like... So the missions take anywhere from like an hour to two hours on your first time. Like they're they're long missions with lots of stuff to do, um, and it has really generous checkpoints, which is is good for a game like that. Like you don't want to you know do thirty minutes of sniping and then you get caught one time because you blow a stealth opportunity and then you have to go back and you know do the last twenty minutes. It's like b- the moment before you encounter the person who killed you is like when it resets you after you die. So like there's not a whole lot. Like you, it lets you exper- experiment. With like your approach, so that way, like, oh, what if I'm really aggressive right here? Like, run out and like try to like melee kill that guy, and like, oh, he caught me and killed me with a shotgun, and like, you don't really lose anything for trying that. Mm-hmm. But there are times when like I'll get killed by some guy, and then like I'm completely surrounded by like 17 guys, like just like hunting for me, and it's like, cool. All right, well, I the checkpoint system just reset me right back to the middle of that mess, or like there's a tank on the other side of this rock, and so like I'm screwed out of it's like it's like the equivalent of like falling off a cliff in Morrowind, and mm-hmm. I saved right before I did it, and now like every time I reload that save, I'm just falling off a cliff again. So it's like I, I have options of either trying and often failing to sprint away from that and like mm-hmm. hide somewhere until like the heat dies down or you know just um like reloading the mission altogether and like replaying you know whatever 45 minutes to an hour i just did yeah. um which is less than ideal is there multiplayer because i think i played multiplayer in sniper elite 3. there is multiplayer okay. um so there's three like main pillars of this game there's the story there's cooperative play, which is like there's uh, survival, which is actually pretty intense. It's kind of like horde mode style survival. I, uh, okay. Yeah, it, it's sniping it, some axis. All right. It's pretty fun. And then uh, there's competitive multiplayer, and they have like the the standard suite like team deathmatch, deathmatch, uh, control. But then on top of that, there's uh, distance king, where uh-huh. it's like team deathmatch only you get points instead of for every kill it's for how many feet your kill was so like that's cool so it's encouraging you to snipe so like you know i snipe you and i got like you know 300 feet or 300 meters whatever the distance is and like dan kills seven people but they reach five feet away from him i would still be in the lead even though i only killed one guy because you know it's 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 measured by distance are you following this dan are you doing that yeah uh, that's a novel idea that is an interesting and then there's also uh i think it's called no cross and what that is is um it's it's just team deathmatch only the teams are completely separated by like this wall in the middle so you you have to yeah so you have to like you know there's like the, the little like no man's land is probably like you know 10 feet wide so you can go right up to the wall and try to take someone out with like a, a smg or something if you want to but it's all about sniping this sounds great is it like that okay here's a deep cut do you guys remember that halo one map that no one at bungie ever acknowledged yeah. the existence of it okay. reminded me of that immediately i love that map for the sniping there mm-hmm. okay does everyone know what i'm talking about the yeah. one where there's space in between and you can see like the, it's just like a full it's like an ant colony that map sucks i love that map it's fun Every once in a while, I would never want to Hang them high mobile. is the best map. Well, of course. Period. <laughs> in all games. Period. Yes. <laughs> and it will not be questioned. That's right. Uh, well, that, that <laughs> sounds good. Okay, maybe I will check out the multiplayer yeah, on this. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty fun. All right. Hey, um, tell me about MLB The Show 17. Sure. 17, 18? The Show 17. The Show 17. Wow. Earlier this week or last week or some time that I can't even recall, um, they released a video showing off like all the new... like gameplay improvements are like all right we got these new physics that make it so like i guess before when you throw the ball and like the the batter would hit it it was as if it was hitting like a like a wall a flat object and now they have it so like it's actually hitting a round object so like the ball actually behaves more realistically this Uh, seems like a basic component of baseball that they should have factored in a long time yeah i think probably okay um and then there's a bunch of graphical improvements and everything but i think the thing that you are going to be most interested in yeah uh because you like weird old school things i'm ready yes retro mode mm-hmm. so did you ever pl- I, I don't know like I, I can never tell if you're going to like something or not because your tastes are so weird how dare you um i mean who would have seen kuru kuru kiru in 
Well, with that kind of pronunciation, who can even hear it? <laughs> hey! Well, that's how they pronounce it in the game. I don't know. It's the best game. So the baseball mode's like that? So you, did you ever play like the, the baseball games on like Genesis and SNES no. and stuff, like Ken Griffey Jr. baseball? I know a lot of people love them. So it's a mode very much inspired by Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball on SNES. Okay. Um, it keeps the same graphics of MLB The Show, but it swings the camera out, so it's like the same... like top-down almost camera of the old games. Yeah. And then it has, like, pixelated text for graphic overlays. Like, it'll say, like, top of the second in, like, pixelated text over top. And then, like, it has, like, this weird, like, retro music playing over top of it. Oh, no. And, like, every once in a while, like, you'll hit the ball in, in play and, like, the, the fielder will make a great catch. You'll hear Ken Griffey Jr. actually come on and go, wow, that was a great catch. <laughs> Like, wait, it's like, is it old clips? Is this no, licensed he came, stuff? Yeah, he came in and actually recorded like one liners for the, the retro mode. Also, which... it just flashes on the screen every once in a while. You'll never grow old and you'll never die. <laughs> um, that wasn't a gray hair you found on your head the other day. I love this game. And <laughs> so um, also they simplified all the controls. So like in the main game, like you press like circle and that throws to first base because it's like mapped out like the the base path. Yeah. And at this, like, you know, you, X pretty much does everything. X is swing, X is pitch, X is advance all your runners on the base path. And then to choose your base, you hit like the D-pad towards whatever base it is and X. And um, also when you're batting, it doesn't matter how high or low the pitch is. It's just like left or right. I love this. What do you think about the strategy of having it hidden inside of this larger MLB The Show package. Wouldn't this be better as like a standalone thing? I, I Well, the thing is, is that there's... An, I don't think it's going to be a destination mode right off the bat. Like maybe in like future years it will be because right now it's just one-off exhibition. It's not really like you can't play a full season in this. It's just like you go to play now and then you there's like retro mode. And like it's like you can choose, you know, to play one game yeah. in retro mode. And it's, it's fun. Like uh, you can... You, you, like the pitching is simple. Like there's, there's, you hit X, he pitches it, and then you, you use the the stick or the D pad to control how fast it is. Like you push down to make it go fast. You okay. hold up to make it a change up, and then you you can control it in midair, like going like left and right to do different like curves. Do you and think this is like the best way? I guess I'm guessing there's a lot of people out there that are nostalgic for old baseball games like this. I mean, I don't think you want to go for RBI Baseball mm -mm. 15 or whatever it was. Like, is this the best place to go, you think, for that good retro baseball experience? I, I guess. I mean, I it, I had a lot of fun playing it. I yeah. just worry about how much depth there is just because, like, there's... <laughs> I would imagine they wouldn't even think there, well, there's I, much. This I love those right? games growing up. Like, I played, like, triple play gold more than almost any other game on my Sega Genesis. Okay. And, like, I even checked it out of our vault and played, like, a season on triple play gold. Like, I love it that much. This is what you do? Instead yeah. of hanging out with us on the this, weekends, this you explains everything. Play triple play gold. Yeah. This Instead of writing me over game. to play rock band with you, you sit around and play triple play gold. Mm -hmm. Except the battery in our vault <laughs> copy is dead, this. so oh, no. you can't you can't save. Oh no! It's really, but I have a retron, so oh, I, I have good. save states. Oh, triple play gold. Yeah. So, I love playing like you know seasons, and unfortunately, that's not a part of this mode. But the gameplay is substantially better than RBI sure. baseball. Um, <laughs> Put the, it on the box. Yeah. The, and and the and the main game itself, it seems like a good incremental sports. Yeah, the, they're okay. they're adding some stuff to the gameplay that makes it seem a lot more meaningful. The graphics look a lot better. I think that it's it's going to be a, uh, a a good addition. I mean, we'll probably hear more on it in coming weeks because the game comes out March twenty eighth. Oh, so yeah, okay. Oh wow. We'll probably hear more soon as our boys like, baseball's back like franchise <laughs> yeah. road to the Crack show the the they crowd. teased at something with road to the show that they were making it kind of like more decision based like at the psx uh reveal they had some opening moment where they just kind of like cryptically hinted that like you were going to be able to make decisions like your coach would ask you to like change a position or something like that and you had a say on if you wanted to or not mm -hmm. but they haven't really detailed anything on that yet okay Cool. Dan Tack, when's the last time you played a baseball game? It probably would have been back in the SNES Sega Genesis days. When's the last time you hit a baseball with a bat? 
in real life. That probably also would have been back in the Sega Genesis <laughs> Nintendo days. All right. Well, time's about to change. It's warming up outside. Let's That's, go. Let's do it. Crack of that bat. I'm, I'm 100% serious, too. Let's go out and knock a few balls around. I love it. It's genuinely fun. <laughs> I play baseball every year. All right. Uh, do you? Yeah. I'm terrible at it. I never played as a kid, but it's really fun just to have a dumb home run derby with friends. It's great. When do you play? How come? Wait. All the time. Wait. You don't invite me to those, but you invite me to oh, rock band here night? we go. That's right. Yeah. Maybe this year, Shay, will become best friends. You didn't friends. invite me to play tennis either when you were on that little streak. That's Well, that was years ago, Shay. But at some point, we're going to become best friends, and it's going to be forever, and oh, it's going to be lasting. This That's what good. this podcast I'm is all about. I'm looking forward to seeing how this turns out. Oh, it's going to be great. You're going to unblock me on Twitter. It's going to be amazing. It's everything. <laughs> You're not blocked anybody... on Twitter. I thought I was. No. Oh, that's so sweet. Anyways, you guys want to move on to community emails? Uh, yeah. Is there, there's no more games? Talk no about. more games. All right, let's go. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. Uh, Brian Shea just had to get out of here. He had to go play some baseball from 1992. He or said nonsense. he was really weirded out by something that happened. I don't it's know what not it important. We have Dan Tech still here. <laughs> I'm still here. And then we have the best of the bunch, Elise. Hey, hey. Welcome. Hey, Hi. hey, indeed. Uh, so we have emails from the community. People sent in wonderful emails to podcastgameformer.com. Uh, they sent in their thoughts, weird questions, great questions, insightful questions, funny questions, feedback, uh, everything you can imagine. We're going to read all of it off. We're going to choose our favorite email of the bunch and ship them out the nicest thing they can possibly imagine. The nicest. The nicest thing. It is a Nintendo Switch made out of moss. <laughs> that would actually be pretty cool. I want one of those. I, I, yeah, we should keep that. Yeah, you're right. You, you know, know what? We'll hang on to that. We'll ship you out something nicer, I promise. Uh, Casey Boatman, which is a great name from God. Indiana, right? All right. He says, hey, everyone. Uh, I was listening to the Breath of the Wild talk in the most recent podcast when Kyle had mentioned that... What he was playing was from a save point that someone had played up to at Nintendo. How do each of you feel about playing in the middle of a game on a preview cover story trip? How do you decide who will actually be doing the playing rather than just watching? Do you fully enjoy being thrown in to see all this? Or is there a small small part of you where it almost spoils bits and pieces of the game when you actually get the full copy? Okay, so let's do this one piece at a time. Please. First one. How do you feel about playing in the middle of a game on a preview cover story trip? I think sometimes it's essential. Some of the other content that goes around it like might not even exist yet, right? So you're getting to see a slice of whatever, you know. You, a lot of times it's going to be one of the cooler parts, you know. It's like they had a cool idea for X level, and this is what you get to see. Yeah. The stuff around it really doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me that we're seeing only that condensed trunk in that time period. It's just, I, yeah, I, I think know. there's times where like I'll preview a game before it comes out and then one th and and there are times where I have to preview that game a few times like I'll do coverage on it a few times and then at that point then I'm just like when I actually play the game in full I'm like okay I know this scene okay I know this and that and it does spoil a little bit a but little bit I, a I feel like it's a necessary thing at the same time so it's yeah it doesn't disturb me that much but i always like it when developers and most of them do this most of the time give a good framework of like hey here's exactly where this is in the story it's kind of at a down moment I in the think story a lot of the time they try to give you like a section that isn't spoiler filled you know? right right for sure um and then they also want to know how do you decide who will actually be doing the playing rather than just watching so we're talking previews it's probably just one person on that preview yeah. so yeah. that person is playing if you're talking covers then i usually i think the, the lead will play um how we have our cover story structured, right? Yeah, it's nice. So then in the story, they can say, hey, I went hands-on with the new Zelda, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And there's always situations where if it's like a multiplayer game or something, there was like, oh, come on, everyone get in here. Everyone jump on. I actually, I just like watching. Mm -hmm. I just like sitting back and taking as many notes, trying to remember as much as I possibly oh, yeah. can for the podcast. Like I will get much more out of that than just, yeah, sure. I technically touched a controller. and As long as, long as somebody's getting the hands-on, right? There doesn't yeah. need to be more than one sometimes. And plus it's tricky. Like for Kyle with Zelda, for example, uh, or I remember Tim was really into this. I forget what the cover story was. Anyways, but when the person who's writing the cover story is playing the game, it's really tricky to remember every beat. So sometimes I'll just take notes. I'm like, they sure. did this, they did this. This popped up at this it, moment. It can be very difficult to remember, especially if it's like a couple hours of gameplay. Right. Then, yeah, there, there are times where, like I remember with Deus Ex Mankind Divided, it was like, they, they showed me a big chunk of that game. And then it was like, ah, I have to remember like, you know, one section to the next and how I got here and how I got there. And even if you're listening to the audio, it's like, I can hear myself say, oh, that's cool, but I don't know what it is. Right. So you can do the awkward right. thing of kind of like narrating what that's you're actually seeing. that's actually what i do is that I, right? I make sure huh. that my audio is still going and if there's someone to talk to about the game then i usually will do that while i'm playing especially at those segments uh that i want to take note of and yeah and if it's just they put me in a room alone then yeah i just record myself talking like wow this thing you know and then i don't i'm like oh, wait a I, minute it's not this thing it's yeah. these are the specific things that i am seeing now that are very cool that i should talk about 
recording yeah. can help or just stopping and taking notes every once in a while. Yeah, for sure. Like Zelda is a good example. Kyle was fighting uh, a boss. Whoa. And then he Spoilers. wrote about it in the cover story. And then I brought it up with him like, oh, you know, that boss was named this. And yes. he had the name a little bit different than the cover story. And it was like a last second catch of, oh, Good. because I wasn't playing. I was able to take the exact name. And Good. then everyone Good was able save. to get angry about it. Because I yes. think it's a huge spoiler. It's a, it's a, I'm it's very upset minus. about that spoiler. No, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Come on. Don't look for <laughs> Nintendo fans. Speaking of Nintendo, um, Rob Kersey writes in. Uh, he's a psychostatic vocalist, an art guy, and a web nerd. He's key to point out he says hey fellers and elise uh i'm in a touring band and really enjoy listening to your podcast on those really long drives thank you and his core question is does nintendo hate money uh <laughs> which comes up a lot he says seriously all switch pre-orders are gone and a good friend of mine who owns three video game retail locations could only get two switches to sell he can't even get any new 3ds's either for some strange reason Another piece of business logic I don't understand is the lack of virtual console releases. The NES, Super Nintendo, N64, etc. has a massive game library, and they don't bother regularly releasing older games. So next time you fellers are chatting with a Nintendo representative or even Reggie himself, please ask them, does Nintendo hate money? That should have been one of our rapid-fire questions uh, yeah, for I, Miyamoto. I, and I, you know, next time I am in an interview with a Nintendo rep, I will... I will lead with that question. And then you're going to follow it up with the Pokemon MMO. Then we'll we'll go into the actual whatever I'm covering. But I'm going to start with that one. So there certainly were the conspiracy theories. I mean, I'm sure when like further back than this, but I remember with the Wii launch about how they're limiting supply of the Wii. I heard that from some pretty reliable places just so they could get the story out there about, hey, you know, it's the hot item this Christmas. Come get it. You would think they would have learned that lesson, especially coming off the heels of the NES Classic. But the Switch is... It is sold out to it's all It's ridiculous, hell. honestly. It's crazy. I, so what do you think their strategy is? Why is this happening? <laughs> well, we, I, I use the term strategy very loosely here. Right. Come on, you guys. <laughs> Listen, I don't know. What I guess do. it creates some sort of buzz and this impression that it's being sold out everywhere. So you think it's artificial? Is I, that what you're saying, Elise? Kind, I, I don't know, man. I can't sit here and... I don't think anybody can know for right? sure. It's the whole, what you the can't have this. Nobody on. can have this. But I, I think I, it I is know. potentially. And, and at the same, what I really believe is that they're they're afraid of making too many that won't sell. So that's why there's that. They just rather they'd rather make sure every unit goes right. I mean, I... it's definitely an issue. <laughs> but and I guess if you're going to have the storyline, the storyline of people are clamoring to get this thing is better than the storyline of the shelves are overflowing. Target doesn't know what to do. It and is. Who, and who, I would you know, say that sounds better. Who yeah. honestly knows? With well, Nintendo, totally. if I could figure Nintendo yeah. out. I wouldn't be here. Never under, <laughs> never underestimate how hot it seems like the Switch is coming in. This thing is coming in for a crash landing. Right. Like, who knows what that UI is really going to be we like? We don't know if the store is going to exist that crazy on that, day one. That we don't know that at this point. Yes. that's it is, insane. It is, it is mind-boggling. Like, I don't think it, that's ever happened at any console launch in history, right? Where mm-hmm. we knew so little, so little about it when it's out in two weeks. Yeah, it is. Yeah, absurd. The, it's the ultimate loot crate. It's a console. <laughs> um, so Brett in Manhattan, Kansas. What? All right, cool. Anyways, he says, the recent interview with Eric Fenstermaker from Obsidian, formerly of Obsidian, was quite topical as South Park, the fractured but whole, has been delayed. In the interview, it seemed that the idea was to, that the idea and stick of truth to parody Skyrim came relatively late. Initial descriptions of fractured but whole lead me to believe Marvel's Civil War would be parodied. However, maybe Civil War isn't so topical for South Park fans now. My question, what about the superhero genre would you like to see South Park parody in Fractured? It is interesting Mm -hmm. i mean this game's been in development for so long now civil war was Mm -hmm. the big talking point right when they announced this game you know back around e3 but they had the framework for this uh for the game many years ago with when they did the superhero episodes on the show right right that's right yeah right yeah there's the whole coon and friends trilogy which isn't Mm -hmm. great and then it went back even further than that like i go back and watch old south park all the time yeah and i always skip those i I think it's a a good (laughs) basis for a game though I, I think so I too. Like, I like the idea of, of parodying superheroes. Although I feel like I kind of got my fill of superhero parodies with Lego Batman movie, which had a lot of fun in it. I just feel like that making I, fun of the superhero genre has done more and more by the time I this game the, comes the, out. I love the Batman parodies, so I wouldn't be against more of that. Yeah, more in that vein. <laughs> I want them to focus. I really like, I think it was at E3, where they had the whole chalkboard and Cartman's walking through like the entire business strategy of like, you can't have your spin off until you are part of this team, all this stuff. I like when they parody the business side sure. of the superhero genre because that's where from. mainly what I'm fascinated by, mm-hmm. Dan. I think you're in the same boat where just sure. the business of making superhero movies is completely fascinating, much more so than how are they going to stop this villain from destroying the world? Like, whatever. Well, Let's just we, talk we, about it. We all know that at this point, right? These, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Uh, and then, I don't know, Ben Affleck and Batman. How about it? Oh, that's a big thing. Yeah, let's see. So Mitch has the pivotal question. With the NES Classic having been available, in quotes, for several months, uh, mm-hmm. and rumors, hopes of a Super Nintendo Classic to follow, I think those are just hopes. I don't think they're rumors. Um, <laughs> in what year do you think we will eventually see a PS3 or Xbox 360 Classic, oh, and what do you want on it? You could just list all the great games. What are like the key games and you for sure well, would want on those? The Last of Us, Red Dead okay. Redemption, yep. Mass Effect Trilogy. That's good. I don't if that it... was just the entire there PS3 360 Classic, <laughs> sold, done. I don't think we'll ever see something like that because I think those mm. companies are more inclined to put older games on their current units. It's hard to know because um, I feel like we're, we're nowhere near that kind of thing right now. So, <laughs> Yeah, it is tricky. It would be far in the future. Dan, are you saying that... Uh, Nintendo has no interest in getting those virtual console games moving forward. Oh, I'm sure they can sell me the same game 30 more times. What do you expect for the Switch's virtual console? Very little. (laughs) It's just... And I'm not trying to be the bad guy here. They have not shown me any reason to have good faith about their online efforts. They really haven't. And if you can can tell me otherwise, I'll I'll I'm sure it takes... I'd imagine it takes more work than we think to get those games up and running on new hardware, everything, and there's like, who... It's not worth the development time. I'm sure they've crunched the numbers. Right. Having this constant trickle rock band network style is just not worth it. You're in telling the me they can't figure out how to do an emulator on, on their own hardware? Oh. Is that what you're telling me? I'm saying they clearly know how, although Wii U was a little bit muddy with some of those NES games, but they clearly know how. I think it's just they've crunched the numbers and apparently it's not worth it. I think it's insane. No, it's better I... It's better for the numbers to sell me the same game 30 times and have no unified platform <laughs> that I can get all my access to, to the titles I've already purchased. I look forward to seeing what the Switch is like. And yes, there's great games on last gen. Honestly, well. I also look forward to seeing what the Switch is like. But I, again, I don't have any reason. They've not given me a reason to have good faith in this. And I, and I'm, Please blow me away. Please be amazing. I'm please be excited. Are you buying one? No, I can't get one. They're all sold out. <laughs> but do you have a Wii U? Uh, I have a Wii. I have, I have a Wii U. Are you guys both playing Zelda then? I'll borrow some. I will. I'll probably play it on my Wii U. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we have Switch fever here, everybody. Kyle Ellis writes in and says, and the subject line. Tack Daddy and mobile games. Uh, ben and crew, the next time Jeez. you have Tack on the podcast, can you please put him on the spot yeah. and ask him if he can name his top five free mobile games? Sure. I think this is in rebuttal to you. Uh, just yeah, because they, they think I don't like the level. practice. They think, and yes, and I want to bring it up again. I want to say it sure. again unequivocally. It's not just Fire Emblem Heroes that sucks at this. It's many, many, many mobile games. The, Gatch- the Gatchapon system is disgusting and predatory. And, so what isn't predatory? And as a consumer defending it, I think, is absolute insanity. But if you want to, you know, I, I that's your opinion. Sure. Uh, so the games that I tend to like still have these kinds of systems, but they don't include any kind of stamina gating. So you can play all you want. So if you want to be the hardcore player that doesn't ever pay, keep playing because the game is good and enjoying it while you unlock new things. Those are the kind of mobile games I like. So a couple of re- a recent example that I really like is uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. Really? Hugely into this game. Probably the best, one of the best Yu-Gi-Oh! iterations that they've ever done. And they've made a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! games. Uh, this what? one, yes. Tons of Yu-Gi-Oh! games. No, I know that. But this one, really, I didn't know that it stood this out This one is awesome because it focuses on the core series. Like before they did all the stupid, awful side series. Like Zexel and all the rest of it. What's the dumbest thing? Because I loved Yu-Gi-Oh! right when it came out. Sure. So this Back is when it was it. cool. This no, but what's, what's the stupidest place that the Yu-Gi-Oh! series went that would surprise oh, God. me? God. Don't ever watch... Th- uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel. I think that was like... What is it? What happens like the, in Zexel? It is awful. What? It, why? It is, it just, if you watch it, your brain will actually just deconstruct and dematerialize and sink down into your shoes. Okay. Is it change the premise? The premise is always the same, right? Okay. Some, some scrappy kid, you know, gets finds cards and does some great stuff with them and there's <laughs> secret for, sources and forces behind everything. Uh-huh. But it's done in like this just... I don't know what happened in those years, but man, it is designed for an audience that is not not me. <laughs> so Duel Links is a game where you can actually flick out the cards. You got the whole it's blue sort of eyes, like, white dragon. The it's whole thing. sort of like the entire. It's the same game, but it's sort of like half of everything. It's so like half life points, half the field space, designed for very quick battles, and it's done so with the iconic units that people would remember from the original series, the original run. So one of your so, favorite mobile games. Yes, absolutely. I think it's done very well. You can play wow. it all you want. Mm-hmm. There is a uh, a stam factor for fighting like auto battles against people. But you can do the PvP and many other kinds of things all you want. You can play all day if you want. And I have. It's an incredible game. Certainly one of the best mobile games I've played this year. Um, and then outside of that, let's say another really one that I really like is called Gems of War by the makers of Puzzle Quest, which you may know. Yeah. 
by the original makers. Uh, this is sort of like a almost an MMORPG match three kind of experience. Uh, so you're still opening chests and everything like that, but you can play as much as you want. There's a guild mechanic. Uh, I think it's really well done, very well crafted. There's never any stopping point. There's no stand bars. Again, if I can't get people away from from gacha shops and all that kind of stuff, then at least don't restrict people's time playing. Let them play it and keep earning rewards. That's essential too. Like you have to be able to keep earning because if you can't, then what's the point, right? Yeah. Then, then you're still locked behind another gate. And that's the whole. That's one of the big issues in me. It's not a bit. You know, you can say all mobile games do this, and I say that is not an argument. That's not an excuse. Just because everybody does it doesn't make it okay. And I think those practices are gross, which is why we have to. That's why regulations happen in other countries. Like, you've got to show the percent chance of getting stuff out of a chest now. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Is that just China? I think. Uh, it, I know it's for sure it's for China. Yeah. But I, I don't know who else is getting on board. Okay. Um. You so haven't brought up Hearthstone yet, and, and Hearthstone is Hearthstone is certainly in the in that crew. Yeah, I don't want to bring that up because I I don't usually play Hearthstone on mobile. I like having that flexibility of being able to go between PC and mobile. But when I'm playing Hearthstone, it's usually on my PC. Yeah, but I do like it as a, a tablet game, so for sure. And then I like those. Um, well, this is free to play, so I can't use that, huh? Okay, but for Hearthstone, yes, sure, that's in the basket. When do I need two more? You don't need them. All right, do, don't don't I? Don't I? So he's looking for free games. You said it's not yeah. free to play, but oh yeah, I like those. Um, man, what are they? Kyrosoft games. You know, with the little guy. Man, those are super fun. They're like simulation games. Huh. Uh, it's called Dungeon Village. Is my favorite one of them. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, you build up a little like colony of RPGers, like archers and warriors and stuff, and you send them out to fight. They do it all like pretty much automated. Yeah. What was that? I think it was called. You must build a boat. Yep. Yeah, that was. If you like your your match threes, Dan's a what? You're a ten million I like, guy. I like that. Okay, but it it just didn't. It, it, I didn't. I wouldn't stick it with on. it very long, but I mean, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, it's a neat concept for mm-hmm. sure. It was unique. So uh, Kyle Ellis Ellis writes in again. Uh, okay. Completely different question. I like it. He says, Ben and crew, same same greeting though. I've been playing games since the NES, but I've never played a Zelda game more than 10 hours. Seems like a long time. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Breath of the Wild, but before it arrives in just a few weeks, is there one Zelda title you would recommend to get me in that Zelda mood? La-di-da. Ooh. Oh, my recommendation would be Zelda A Link to the Past. Is that right? Possibly the oh, best video game that, ever created. I, I stand by that. Um, I think it's the best game. My favorite Zelda game. I think it's the best, not only the best Zelda game, but the best game of all time. The only, As close as you can get to being a perfect constructive game. I tried playing that for the first time in college, and I had a really tough time with it. I never got through it. That's I fair. constantly feel bad. Those dungeons are tough. Yeah. I understand everybody has them memorized now, but going in as an idiot college student, mm-hmm. I was really having a tough time with those things. <laughs> I hear you. There's a lot of walkthroughs. I, I like Wind Waker a lot, too. Yeah? I, for sure. Here's the thing. We're getting down to the wire with Breath of the Wild. I know we're rolling out a whole month of content on GameFormer.com. This thing's coming up so soon. Don't burn yourself out on Zelda. Here's what you want to do, Kyle. You want to sit down. You want to get the Zelda Symphony CD that came with Skyward Sword. Just listen to that full soundtrack, the full orchestra playing the greatest hits from the Zelda series. It is absolutely amazing. That'll get you in the mood in the perfect way. You won't get burned out on gameplay. You don't have to worry about inventories, side quests, worrying about rupees, wallets, none of that. Just listen to the music. You could not be more primed after that to dive into Breath of the Wild. Right, Dan? Yeah, although I'd say that I, you know, from what I've seen, I haven't actually done any hands-on Breath of the Wild, but it's so different from the traditional Zelda experience in, yeah. in a lot of ways that I don't know that you could burn yourself out with an older one. But... Hey. Yeah. Whatever. I guess if you go from Link to the Past to Breath of the Wild, it might be yeah. different enough. Uh, so Ricky in Buffalo says, Dear Game Informants, hello. Uh, born in 1990, my first gaming system was a Sega Genesis. Uh, I still hold deep affinities for games like Lion King, Altered Beast, Toy Story, some crappy baseball game that Brian Shea likes, mm-hmm. Comic Zone, and an obscure title called Fairy Tale. Mm-hmm. I never played more than four minutes of it as a child because skeletons come at you and I was just too scared. <laughs> I recently popped in the fairy tale and was sucked in more than anyone should be sucked into a 16-bit game in 2017. My question is simply, anyone else got some love for the fairy tale? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you show me that, you know, Hanson showed me a video that earlier today. I'm like, I remember this game. You played the fairy I did, tale? I did, I did play that, yeah. Yeah. As it was, uh, I, I know I played, I don't know how much I played of it, because that was that, it was that game and King's Bounty for Genesis that I would always really gravitate to because those were experiences I couldn't find on the SNES. What is King's Bounty? King's is highly highly big strategy game. Like um you would recruit different units like from the beginning of the game you'd be like recruiting peasants and little gnomes and crappy fairies and then later on of Ooh. course you'd be getting dragons. Sort of like procedurally generated stuff kind of stuff like stuff that was way beyond, way above its time. 
So a strategy fantasy experience where you'd build up an army sort of became the Heroes of Might and Magic Ooh. Uh, down the line. Okay. So this is the best comparison I can give you. Fairy Tale, it looked bizarre it. and hideous, and it really was just this overhead kind of Ultima-style yes. perspective with just a spooky skeleton chasing people it around was a, a map. I like don't know Sinistar. anything about this. So. Very oh traditional God. sort of RPG for the time. Reminds me of uh, another SNES RPG like called Draken, I think it was the name. Yeah. Just like, I mean, you look at them now and you're like, God, what an eyesore. But they, they were powerful RPG experiences, very hardcore at the time. Genesis best RPG. Ooh. Fantasy Star Four. Four. Seems like four is the favorite. Yeah, everyone likes four. Yeah. I've never started those games, but I've never gotten into I like them. two and four. I like anybody you'll automatically go down on my book as a cool gamer if you just mention, oh, favorite game of all time? Fantasy Star Four. It's like, okay, I assume you know what you're talking about. <laughs> but, but, I'll probably yeah, never play it, but, but... Yeah, it's a traditional pick, but at the same time I could make the argument like I think I probably like Shining Force Two more than Fantasy Star. And which one is that? Shining Force 2 was yeah. sort of like a Fire Emblem style game. Oh, that's um, right. Okay, yeah. And then, of course, and I, I, I would be remiss to not say Shining in the Darkness is also like a very critical RPG for that console. For is that, that right? Yeah. Wow. You straddled the RPG gap between Genesis and I played and all the huh? RPGs in SNES and, and Genesis. I was big into them, yeah. Jeez. They were actually hard Goodness. back then. So, you know, okay. they were cool. All were right, good. buddy. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Ricky in Buffalo says, P.S. Stay strong, JV. Not everyone is blessed with being as smart as us snobs. So there we go. Um, let's see. This is from Nick in Park Ridge, Indiana. He has a simple question. Please ask Dan Tack why he was in Australia. I can't answer that question. Excuse me? I was me? there vacationing. Recently? <laughs> How's that? Uh, no. Does he, does he say recently? I haven't been there lately. Dan Tech, this is this is, this is getting fishy. When was the last time you were in Australia? Australia? I don't know, probably like ten years ago. Ten years ago, maybe fifteen. And you're not going to tell us you why? Can't, no, he, no, he won't. I was vacationing. It's not he won't say. He can't say. My 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 response is that I was vacationing. What did you do on this vacation? I was on holiday. Are you an <laughs> American spy? I work for Game Informer. How does this person <laughs> know that you going to Australia is I don't a thing? Know. I'm very curious to, about that myself. <laughs> do you know a Nick from Park Ridge, Indiana? This is weird. No, not that I know. Elise, have you ever heard a more satisfying answer to that question? That was, it was I odd. You, I was on vacation. <laughs> Indeed it was. I was on vacation. Then why not just say I was on vacation? I it just, was great. I, I saw a kangaroo. It well, made there, me smile. There's obviously something I saw more a kangaroo. I saw a wombat. I saw all kinds of cool stuff. I think you saw some missiles or something. What the hell's going what on in your life? What did Dan Taxi in Australia? <laughs> right in. Let us know. Podcast Gameformer.com. Uh-huh. What did you didn't do? Um, <laughs> hello, Game Informer team. Please help. I'm growing ever more disillusioned with the gaming community and the industry. Mm. Uh, quote unquote, hardcore gamers only seem to applaud innovation when it suits them. Otherwise, they deem it as stupid and a useless gimmick. <laughs> For example, the Wii led to PlayStation Move, which is now part of PlayStation VR. Yet anytime Nintendo tries to include motion controls these days, gamers almost dismiss it outright. Whether it's Star Fox Zero, Splatoon, or ARMS, people immediately ask for an option with traditional controls before even have tried it. The demand to stick with tradition is rather unhealthy. One might argue that as the consumer, they should be allowed to play the game however they want. It would kind of be like creating an option in Mario 64 to play with the D-pad. They probably could, but what's the point? I read this same... I read the same outrage about Metroid Prime Federation Force. Their argument was that Metroid Prime is a solitary game of exploration. No laughing, Dan. Why are they making it a team-based shooter? Well, Super Mario is a running and jumping platformer. Why is he driving a go-kart? I just don't think it's a healthy attitude for the community. This is from Professor IQ. All right. First, uh, first of all, I'll say, yeah, you know what? If the industry wants to take chances with stuff, then go, go nuts. It. There's for honor. For but, like, but you can you can big, you can have a swing and a miss that destroys your entire company. So you kind of have to be careful with that, right? Like, uh, I don't know. I feel like... I feel like a lot of people get comfortable in their habits and get, you know, like you're used to what you're used to and there a lot of people don't want to change in that sense. Very but much there's, so. There's definitely that sensation, I guess. But There is that tendency, though, to only think in the community and industry, it's easy you to know, just focus I think, on. I think a lot of the motion stuff is just very goofy for <laughs> a lot of the yeah. time and or it doesn't work that great. Like if you look at the connect and stuff like that. So if it's not well implemented in the first place, then that's an issue. And I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's it's a mix of like skepticism and uh, people just wanting to stick to what they know. I hear you. I think Professor IQ has a point, though. I think we are so focused on the most hardcore crowd, and that's fine. It's nice when they have those options, but you do not give enough credit to going for that blue ocean, the Nintendo strategy. I mean, 
I mean, it's always refreshing to see something new and strange and different. And people really like the Wii and the motion controls. Like Wii was crazy. Yeah. For sure. Ben Reeves and I were just on the street filming some mysterious stuff. Um, and it's amazing talking to random people on the street about video games. P everybody brings up the Wii. And surprisingly, in 2017, people still bring up the Kinect. Like, oh, is this like the Kinect? Is it kind of like the Kinect? Like that type of crazy I, I broad think, base, it had a real splash in the I think a lot of those community. people, I mean are just not as engaged in the industry, so you don't hear about them as much. Yeah. You know, like the like the people that were really into the Wii or more into casual games, you don't hear from them. So, I don't know. They, they exist, and obviously the Wii took off like crazy. So, yeah. you know. If Nintendo can court that market again, I understand if, it's frustrating if, to if see they, all if, these motion controls, but it, let, them, let them at least reach into that giant pool of money. Right, Dan Tack? I don't think it's that, you know... We don't want new experiences and innovation. I think it's why not? Why not both? Right? If you want to do something crazy and wacky with one of your beloved IPs, then do it. But give us a two D Metroid too. Is that is that so much to ask? One for you, one for us. So make, ev make everyone, then? make everybody happy, right? All right, there we go. Uh, Elise, I hope you're on board for this question. This is from mm. Zane Dukes from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh -oh. Okay. Uh, who points out they've been a member of the GI community since 2003 which I'm trying to wrap my mind around what the GI community looked like in 2003, but I love it. That's God bless school. you, Zane. Uh, God bless you literally after this question. Here we go. Uh, good afternoon, GI crew. It's been five years. I believe it's finally time to defend the Mass Effect 3 ending. Zane <laughs> is crawling out of hiding. Um, Shepard's journey flawlessly culminates, flawlessly, in the green ending when you consider the messianic themes, illusions scattered throughout the series. Resurrection, standing as an apocalyptic prophet against the council, the Krogan's female, the Krogan female story, confrontation on the cliff between Legion, Tally, and Shepard. By the way, Mass Effect spoilers, everybody. <laughs> uh, they're all incredible uses of Christian stories in a modern criticism of the Messiah. Admittedly, the biblical allusions are overtly referred to as a quip, but many of the plot points are structured around Bible stories that aren't usually referenced in the gaming world. Do you think gamers are ill-equipped for stories that are reacting to other works of art or culture? I honestly believe that the retake Mass Effect uproar could have been avoided if there was a better understanding of what Bioware was trying to say with the Shepard story. Ooh, what do you uh, think? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I mean... It, it that's an interesting point of view, but I don't. I feel like people were more upset about the Mass Effect three ending because they felt like their options were limited. Correct. I don't know if you know. <laughs> I'm not being sure. Connected if, I'm not sure the, if the, if that's like a direct connection I would make. It seems like Zane is pushing that a but... little bit too hard about like Bioware was intending this to be a biblical allegory. I mean, I'm sure conversations come up. You can't avoid the world's most popular stories. I, I guess my, my I, yeah. What I have to say here is like, so what if it is? Does that make it a just because it's a biblical allegory doesn't make it any better. Well, therefore, it's intelligent. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Did I like it or not? I think that's <laughs> that is a very good point. Yeah, it either works as a story or not, and people are frustrated by the, all of their experience in a certain community's perception that it boils down to just three options, which I don't think is Hey, fair. I'm with them. Um, are you? Actually, yeah. I think it's ridiculous that they, they pigeonhole you into that. After so much rigmarole about giving you all these choices, you really have none. Well, I Well, what about the debate that's been brought up a million times. I'm not times. like, you I'm know, sure I'm not frothing. I'm not going to get on, take to Twitter and start Dan, frothing. I've seen into your mouth. There's so much froth. I, I'm not going to do that, but I'm just saying I can be disappointed with it I, at, without going I into hear a you. rage. And at least I'm curious to get your feedback on it. <laughs> right. The debate that always gets brought up, and I remember Joe bringing this up a lot, Reiner bringing it up a lot, right when Mass Effect 3 came out, it was a lot of talk about that entire game is the payoff of your choices along the way. I, I, I'm honestly with you. Like, I, I wasn't so outraged by the Mass Effect 3 ending myself. I... Yeah, like you're kind of limited in terms of what ending you can have, but yeah. it, you're right. It's about the journey, you know, and it's about uh, the whole experience for me anyway. Yeah. So why was it so offensive to you, Dan? Didn't say it was. Again, I said I was disappointed, not outraged. Okay. I can but be let down by a thing and not demand that it has to change to me and be like, eh, I, that kind of sucks. I don't like the idea of, I mean, I know they went back and they released that like director's cut of the ending and stuff. And I just, yeah. I, I, I never feel like that's necessary. <laughs> Like, I don't like it when developers go back and, like, change something just because fans are upset. I think, you know, you should say the ending that you wanted to put and, you know. I, yeah. don't, I don't think they should change think, either. I don't think they should actually. go and appease people. But and you should never underestimate how much that uproar had an impact on Bioware. Like, it really yes. rocked that studio no, emotionally right. in a and, big way. I mean, I can understand, right? It's your art and you're going to be a perfectionist, perfectionist sorry, perfectionist about it. Yeah. But, um... 
you know, you're never going to please everybody. I, and I, yeah. it's, I, I feel like that was just so blown out of proportion for me. Yeah, there's a great uh, Matt Birds in uh, the Mass Effect Andromeda issue of Game Informer posted a big, or wrote a big uh, oral history about the history of Bioware. And there's a whole section about the ending of Mass Effect 3 and the impact it's it had on the read. team. Uh, mm-hmm. I highly it's recommend a, it. Yeah, no, you should definitely dig it up, check it out. Um, but there's still so many comments in every interview that we posted with, uh, Mac Walter is a creative director for Andromeda. There's so many comments on YouTube where it's, this is the guy that ruined Mass Effect 3. I just, I don't understand that narrative. I understand you can be slightly disappointed with Mass yeah, Effect not, 3 not, compared again, to 2. I'm not, I'm not saying it's you. I'm not, not saying it's I'm you, not you, holding Dan. a pitchfork. I'm saying a big part of the, com- uh, the internet and just commenters in general have that viewpoint that Mass Effect 3 was this travesty and I just yeah, do gamers, not understand it. Gamers are extremely passionate about what they, their, favorite, their favorite it's things. They, to them, it was it, it's a huge it's, it was a huge blow They to them. hold that game dear to their hearts <laughs> and they can't Go back any... and play it. It's still so good. Mm-hmm. There's so much to love in that game even if I understand you're a little upset and, about the choices at the end. but And that's, that. I mean, specifically yeah. that is what they brought up. I don't think there was a lot of anger at the actual game. It's it just, uh, unfortunately tied to that ending which is where the ire was was focused yeah if i'm not mistaken so alex uh hanavan says hey gi crew it seems like whenever you turn around there's another franchise making the jump to open world gameplay the latest obviously being breath of the wild what film would you like to see get the triple a open world game treatment that has never had a game adaptation before oh or never le- had a game adaptation? or at least in a few a console film, generations oh, a film to game adaptation that must be open world yes the reason I say this is because I would count Mad Max, even though there was something on the NES. Does it have no, to no, no, be no. something that's never been a game before? No, no, at least for a couple generations. Damn. What are you thinking, I mean, Because I was thinking Harry Potter. Like an open world Harry Potter game. It, it you prints, are completely It prints right. money. It is insane that there are I not more Harry Potter games. I want an actually good Harry Potter game. You know, Rocksteady's not doing anything. Uh, WB license. Or, you, know, I, you know what I want? I want like a Hogwarts-themed Harry Potter game that's like in the style of Bully. I think you just want to reskin a bully. <laughs> I think I just but want bully with, too. But yeah. with magic. Oh, I'm listening. Come on. That'd be, a, be the so dumbest great. twist. That bully's back and now they have wands. Have actually, I think that's all I want. Yeah, all I actually, want. That, that'd be pretty cool. But as far as licenses in gaming that have just are not being taken advantage of, it seems like Harry Potter is number one, right? That's a big one. I or see. an MMO, Harry Potter MMO. That's something I've wanted for like ever. Danger, the, dangerous Waters in those MMOs these days. But I, can see I know, but that's what I wanted for like my whole life. Yeah, I didn't know you were a big Harry Potter person. I love Harry it could have, if, if there's an IP that could do it just based on the IP, it's that one. For there's sure. got to be some mobile Harry Potter cash cow. Who's making money off Harry Potter games right now? Who Lego? Isn't? Who isn't? Potter Re-releasing? War. Ugh. So my, my pick would be Yu-Gi-Oh! Just for the... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, of course, and I'm going to go Animorphs. Uh, make a good Animorphs game. Although apparently there's like a Pokemon clone for Game Boy Color that's uh, Animorphs that I this, really need to play at some point in my life. This isn't a film, but I would love to see like Telltale Stranger Things. That would be I, cool. I don't think you have to love that. I'm, I'm sure, you know. That would be I, so I, great. I believe that that's an inevitability, not a Man, wish. Man, I hope so. Yeah, they'll get around <laughs> to everything at some point. Uh, Florim writes in and says, Dear Ben Hansen and GI Team, who was your mentor when you first arrived at GI, and how did they help you? It's nice to see that newcomers such as Elise, JV, and Suriel have been embedded successfully. <laughs> it's like they're ticks. I don't know. And it made me wonder if and who were guiding them in the first months of their new roles. Huh. Uh, Dantak, what about you? Who would you consider That's your a really mentor? Great question, it though. is a great question. Mentor. Huh. When you first got here, I think Dantak and I are kind of in I'm weird, a, similar I'm in a unique position where it's like it's different for us. Right? We were because both kind of replacing people who, yeah. and then we kind of stand alone as a weird island right. when we first showed up. So it's tough. Like I'm the only one doing what I do. So it's right. a very. I mentored myself. Like, what am I going to say? No, like, come a, on. No, I guess Reiner. Maybe I, it's very difficult because it's a it's a very. Again, our islands are yeah. are strange are in strange waters in this matter. I think like we don't have direct. Well, you can certainly I, look up to like Matt Miller for his. Oh, uh, for sure, certainly. I, yeah, but there's lots. Of, I could just name everybody, but that's a cop out, right? Right. Except I mean, for that one person. Bertz is the one that hired me and went through that kind of grueling process of getting me here. That's true. So I definitely look up to him for that. Why do you say grueling? Um, well, it took, it, it was, goodness, five or six months before I, I was actually able to move here. You guys made a decision on me, like, earlier on, and then just a whole bunch of things in terms of being Canadian and school and stuff halted. Yeah, trying to import a lease into process, Minnesota I guess. was brutal. That was, that was something. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, I think, you know, Kim and I also get along really well, just in terms of, I think, 
I, I do a lot of feature writing, so she definitely kind of quote unquote mentored me with that and helped me kind of learn the ropes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think mentor is a weird. It word. is a it is a strange word, but um, I think it definitely happens. There's there's but there there are people that kind of. I mean, I know I have coworkers that kind of help me out when I need it or have my back kind of thing. Sure. And, uh yeah i think like dan but and tim were surprisingly think, big for me when i first i got feel here. like we have such like a, a loose hierarchy at game informer where yeah. you know i remember <laughs> one of my first days here i had to to proof one of one of reiner's articles and i was just like this is so weird like i have to proof my boss's work and <laughs> that's just the way it is you know we all edit each other's stuff and we're yeah. all you know it's cool the output is a weird hive mind yeah <laughs> Uh, Reiner, I'm sorry. Your our, our take is wrong. It should be more my take. I'm sorry. Uh, Trevor Johnson from New Orleans says, Hey guys, I was wondering if any of you used to, or still do experience anxiety when interviewing people in the industry. I'm going to school for journalism and I become a nervous wreck every time I have to interview someone. Is this something you get over with practice or am I just not cut out for it? Any interviewing tips are welcome. Also PS, the Sonic 2006 super replay is incredible and you've been killing it with the cover features. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think I always feel slight nerves when I'm meeting someone for the first time. Yeah. But I think I'm much less nervous to be the interviewee than I, uh, sorry, to be the interviewer than, than the interviewee. Yeah. I I don't like being on the receiving end as much. Yeah. Both can be really tough during like job interviews and stuff like that. Job interviews are a whole other thing. Yeah. That's right. Job it interviews insane. freak me out. Uh, I find that the best cure for that type of anxiety which still pops up like every once in a while, like the Alex Rogopoulos interview coming up was definitely one where I was surprisingly nervous during it. Or like Ron Gilbert, I was really nervous during. Mm. Tim Schafer was really nervous, but. If it's someone that I like actually specifically look up to. Yeah. You know, like Tim Schafer, I would freak out over. Freak the hell out. I, I would, think, man. But a good cure is just having a laser focus on what, exactly what you want to talk about. And also. Just like as long as, long as you're prepared. Prepared then. and also like passion can override a lot of anxiety and just think about personally. it it's a conversation right right like it should be you know if this person's a good interview then it should be an easy enough back and forth mm -hmm. and just keep it casual and if you're asking things that you genuinely want to know the answer from and you actually want to learn from this person instead of just okay if I have you're to go too, down this bullet but also point, if you're too point. robotic about it or too uptight then i feel like that also ruins an interview yeah like you just got to keep in mind hey this is just another person that i'm talking to you know yeah. What I would recommend. Please, Dan. Is he, uh, I don't know what his craft is, where his trade is, but he would mm -hmm. go to a trade show in his business for journalism, whatever, and then do schedule like three morning appointments, a lunch interview, three evening appointments, and then a dinner interview of some kind. Just do them back to just back. Just fry yourself? It's exactly like, you know, fear of flying, you know? You just do it so much that eventually you're you're too worried. You don't have time to worry about it, right? Yeah. You're just doing it. And then by the end of the day, you're like, wow, you know what? By the second or third interview, I wasn't even like caring about the nerves are gone. You're just, you're in flow, right? Don't give yourself time to get anxious about it. It's and not then, about giving yourself time. It's just, it's more like you're doing it so much that yeah. you become, you be, you, you've done it so much that the fear and anxiety are gone. And then next thing you have to do it, you can be like, well, I did like 20 back to yeah. back and I survived just fine. Yeah. yeah. It's nothing. Just jump into the water. It's fine. You got it. Uh, Jerry from Gilbert, Arizona says, I thought of a game somewhat like back of the box trivia that might be fun to play. Below, you will find the tagline and or with the final paragraph of some reviews that Game Informer has done recently. Oh, boy. I've <laughs> omitted any important words. I thought it might be fun to see who can recognize which review is being talked about. Great. Now, you guys maybe didn't help proof some of these reviews, uh, All right. but let's see how well you do. This is going to be rough. All right, let's 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 have a buzzer system, a two-man buzzer system. So, Elise, you say Elise. Dan Tech, you say Dan. Right. Buzz in with your name. Here we go. Blank tries a ridiculous amount of things and i'll be damned if it doesn't always succeed in its own weird way the blank series has established a cult following in the west but it hasn't managed to break through to the mainstream if there's any justice in this world that's about to change elise you look so ready to say something elise yes <laughs> the kingdom hearts oh no 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 i'm sorry cult following in the west Blank tries a ridiculous amount of things. This person was clearly hot on this game that the series is in a cult following in the West, know. and this is the one that he hopes will right. make it break out. Yakuza Zero! Jeff oh, Cork's Yakuza there. Zero yeah. review. I should have gotten that. That would make All right, sense. here we go. If you skipped Blank on Wii U, Blank offers what is essentially a straight port. It doesn't feel downgraded, even if the visuals aren't quite as sharp. Dan. Dan. 
Yarn Yoshi. Yoshi's, Wo- Yoshi's Woolly World. I need the full 3DS name. I'm Yoshi's sorry. Woolly World. Poochie and Yoshi's <laughs> Woolly World on Nintendo 3DS, Dante. Oh, I'm Kyle Hilliard. I should get count. I should count. Blank successfully builds on the solid stealth combat foundation of the original while introducing enough fun new gameplay concepts to feel fresh. Come on, Elise, I'm counting on you. Whether you prefer sticking to the shadows or gutting every co-conspirator in the land... The game offers a rewarding experience with attractive upgrade paths. The narrative doesn't match the high bar of the gameplay and world building, but Blank nonetheless delivers a must-play revenge tale among the best in its class. Dishonored 2! Oh, okay. <laughs> Dishonored 2. How far, we're so bad at this. How, how, okay, so we're going like a few months back. Uh, there are a couple months. A couple months. All right, here we go. Here we go. Blank's RPG elements might be blank thin. I see what this person did here. <laughs> oh, oh, um, this is Paper Mario Colors. Damn, there we go, Elise. Here we go. Elise, Elise. No, you got it. You I got it. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, even with a new studio leading the development charge, blank is a return to form for the series and is a continual delight, even if it does unnecessarily cling for dear life to the past. Damn. Damn. Gears of War. Four. There we go. And don't let unnecessary roadblocks scare you off. Blank is a wonderful co-op experience and a party game that hits all the right notes in turning friends against each other and making even the quietest people scream uncontrollably. <laughs> Good lord. What? Tagline. Wonderful chaos in the kitchen, I'm guessing. Dan. Dan. Overcooked. There we go. Overcooked. Okay. Hey guys, we should read more Game Informer reviews. This is the lesson. <laughs> we here. read too many, I think, is the problem. Is that right? You're just numb to all blend of them? together. Yeah. Do you guys like editing reviews? That's fine. Reviews are one of the. It, it, the problem with reviews is you've probably already read them several times before we actually get to the editing. Like you, you often read them. Reviews like are a. Three you read times. reviews a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wait. So the problem more than is features. you've read them so many times, and you have to edit them, and you become numb to them. I mean, yeah. You know, like, like sometimes when I see a review, it'll be the fifth time mm-hmm. before really? it goes in the magazine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. True. Oh wow. I mean, that's not every time, but it's just like, wow. Which, mean, which means we should be better at that game. Yeah. No, that's fine. No, I think Jerry did a good job. That's a it, fun game. It was. Thank you for the game, that Jerry. Cool. We love you, Jerry. Uh, what is the best email? I give it, I give it to Jerry. You give it to old Jerry? Uh, and he, people are going to say it's just because of the last one, but I like the fact that he brought, he brought a game to the that mat. That was really creative. Yeah. It is good. I like I like the mentor one. Yeah. All I'm right, not, Jerry. I'm not the mentor one. Jerry, at what, the al- end? what else you got? This is another or one. Or the, like? the oh film series. That like you I could be, I could be game. swayed, but the, I think the mm-hmm. game was a good one. Does Nintendo hate money? No, come, uh, come on. Cover story, <laughs> play <laughs> sessions, uh, superhero parodies. No, uh, I think Zelda. I think Jerry is the winner. Here. All right, Jerry. Yeah, congratulations. Jerry's, Jerry's the man. We love you, Jerry. Thank you for sending in that long, wonderful email. Uh, and that's it for this section of the Game Informer show. Uh, stay tuned for an interesting chat with Harmonix's Alex Rogopoulos about the past, the highlights, and the future opportunities for Rock Band and Harmonix. Stay tuned for that. Alex Rogopoulos, welcome to the Game Informer show, sir. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to talk to you. I am a huge fan of harmonics and your history. You have a fascinating company rolling over there. I appreciate that. Are you still fascinated by it? You still trying to understand what harmonics is? Uh, I am actually because, I mean, it's been almost 22 years at this point, but every single year is different from the year before it and the year before that. And so, I mean, the industry is changing so much and the genre that we live in is evolving so much that... Um, you know, it's, it never gets dull or it never feels repetitive. Is that constant change you think just necessary for big indies like yourself? Um, I think so. I mean, I also think that when you're doing creative work, um, you know, repetition can feel like death, right? So on the one hand, uh, the, the constant change is, um, you know, really keeps you on your toes. It's terrifying to some degree, but it's also creatively invigorating because you're constantly being forced to grapple with new forces that have to be wrangled. And imagine a huge part of that too is just research and meetings and reaching out to places you never thought you'd reach out to. Uh, that is absolutely true. And especially for us, I mean, of course, there's all, like in there's all of that activity within the game industry, but there's also a lot of that activity for us outside of the game industry with, you know, uh, in the music world as well. Oh yeah? Oh, what yeah? type of stuff? Excuse me? What type of stuff in that field? 
Oh, well, just, um, I, I, you know, we try to maintain a constant dialogue with recording artists, with artist management, with labels, with music publishers, uh, concert promoters, et cetera, to, you know, and of course, everyone here just ingests a ton of music. And we, um, you know, try to, to have the cultural forces that are at play in the music world inform some of our thinking about game making as well. It's just trying to see where the music industry in general is going outside of the world of just trying to get more rock band DLC rolling. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. So what has the last year been like for Harmonic since the release of Rock Band 4? Um, Well, so there, I mean, boy, we've been busy. There has been a lot going on. So first of all, we released Rock Band 4, you know, and that was very much like an initial release, uh, you know, the beginning of what would become a a long period of of, uh, extended development on that title. So we've been, you know, it's uh, Rock Band 4 has been, kind of our first uh, experience at managing a console release as a live title. And we've been uh, through most of 2016, we're actually shipping monthly updates or, you know, every month or two, uh, you know, material updates of a functionality or content. And then a major new release in the fall with the Rivals expansion, which was a big update. And then we just last week rolled out synchronous online multiplayer play at long last, et cetera. So we've been hugely occupied just continuing to build out and expand and improve the the rock band, the core rock band experience on the console. So that of course has been keeping us busy, but we have also had at least three other significant projects, very different from each other uh, underway this year and trying to get our heads around those and, and do uh, you know, do great service to the creative visions on those titles has been keeping us occupied. You know, of course, rock band VR is, is the, the largest uh, of those that we've announced so far. Yeah, definitely. Is that just going to be a VR version of Rock Band 4 then? Or what does it actually look like? Uh, it's going to be very, very different from huh. from the traditional Rock Band. I mean, actually, legacy Rock Band gameplay will be supported. There will be a mode in the game where you can go and do, you know, the, the Rock Band gameplay that you already know and love in VR. And it's actually, you know, pretty cool. But, um, you know, one of the things that we found early in development, and I think a lot of developers moving in, into uh, VR have experienced this, is that the medium uh, VR demands very different things of game developers to create experiences that really play to the strengths of VR. And in the case of Rock Band in particular, you know, conventional Rock Band is a game that forces the player to focus their visual attention at a tiny little spot on the screen where all the notes are uh, and, ne- and never even blink, never look away, like really just zone in and look at this one spot uh, as they play a, a song note for note perfectly from beginning to the end. And that's great and it really works. It's a mesmerizing experience that works great on the consoles, but it is antithetical to everything that makes VR awesome. You know, when you're on stage, you know, you're on a rock and roll stage, you've got a band, you've got a crowd gazing at you, you've got the, you know, the bright lights that you look up at them, like, well, you, you, when you want to, like, that's amazing, you want to be there, you want to be on the stage, like, making eye contact with your band, like, you know, gazing back at the adoring crowd, like, losing yourself in the lights and everything, like, that's what makes rock performance awesome in VR, and as soon as you put a track in front of you that you must look at and never look at anything else, you lose all of that, the great virtue of the medium. And so we, you know, uh, about a year ago in our early experiments with Rock Band VR, we were confronting that reality and realizing that we had to essentially reinvent, you know, rock music performance simulation for VR and come up with, you know, an entirely different approach um, to gameplay that played to the strengths of the medium. Um, and then we did that. We invented a completely new gameplay system and, um, and have been bringing that to life over the course of the year. And we're you know, really happy with what it has evolved into. So you mentioned uh, Rock Band 4 and it being like a real effort to maintain it as a live service moving forward. I remember that was the pitch for like Rock Band 1, though. It was like, hey, we want this to be a platform. It's going to be evolving. So what do you see as the difference there between generations? Um, well, I would say frequency uh, is the big thing, meaning that in the case of the, you know, the seventh gen consoles and the original rock band, we would do title updates like once a year. And the way that it was a platform for us was that all of the content, the music that you bought would migrate forward. So that investment you were making in building out your music library would be an investment that would carry forward to, you know, and work with all the new functionality we would introduce, you know, in each annual update. Um, in the case of the eighth gen, you know, Rock Band 4, which we're operating right now, 
um, we didn't want to limit ourselves to annual updates. Uh, we really wanted to, you know, uh, build out the experience and also get feedback from the community on a much more uh, rapid and frequent basis, which is what led us to that monthly update model. Yeah, yeah. So you guys have done so many projects. You've been around for so long. What period, era of harmonics do you find yourself thinking about the most? Uh, boy, it's a it's an interesting question. I I think the simple answer is the is the present one. And what oh, I mean that's by the most that boring one, Alex. I, Come on. You know, is that I don't um you know, I uh, we're generally, you know, so uh, like the present and solving for the needs of the present is often like uh, commands so much attention and sweat that it doesn't actually like leave a lot of time for like reflection on like the best or worst periods, uh, you know, <laughs> of the past. I mean, obviously, look, there was a window from about 2006 through 2008 where Rock Band had just uh, become explosively successful. It was everywhere. The company was growing from like, you know, 60 people to like 300 people over that period of time. It was, uh, you know, we were incredibly, you know, we were very present in culture in a way that was like really gratifying. That was like that, that you know, a heyday of sorts that was amazing. So you would think that it would, it, we could just simply like look back on that as this like golden, golden era where everything was awesome. Uh, but in fact, like that period nearly killed us, you know, growing an organization from like, you know, like whatever quadrupling or more the size of an organization is like brutally difficult. It's filled with like personnel chaos. Um, we were like locked into like a mortal battle in the marketplace with like Guitar Hero, you know, fighting against Activision, which is like this huge, incredibly competent publisher that we were like in competition with. We were like having to figure out how to build and you know manufacture hardware, something we had never done before. And by the way, OK, so like make seven million plastic guitars and ship them into the market by next holiday when you've never made hardware before go right that was like that like we that nearly killed us that year so it's funny like that period that should have been like this amazing glowing era of everything just being like easy and awesome was like the opposite it like nearly killed us like trying to you know hold on during that period so you know every period has, has had its great you know its bright spots and its its challenges yeah so i think from the outside perspective you're totally right. People look on that era and it's like, oh man, what a crazy arms race. Rock band, guitar hero going at it. And it's interesting to hear you kind of validate that. Like, yeah, it did feel like an arms race. I mean, to what extent is that? Are you guys in the studio playing every new guitar hero release, taking notes, dissecting everything that you can do better? Is it like a very direct competition in your eyes? Well, let's see. I would say yes and no. Um, I mean, of course, when you're in, a, you know, in competition like that, yeah, you want to know your the competing product int intimately. So yes, of course, we would play all those games and we would try to identify the best aspects of them and the worst aspects of them and think about how that, that informed our own creative decisions and that sort of stuff. So there is an element of competitive analysis because you just need to be situ situationally aware. But at the same time, you know, we always um, very much embraced a philosophy of, uh, you know, wanting to lead our competitors and not follow them. And so while it was like good data to have, we also never, um, never wanted to let that data uh, corrupt our own um, instincts or um, intel about like what the right future was for the Rock Band franchise. You know, we would develop strong convictions about what we thought was right, what we thought was right for our players, and um, and competitive, and, and generally tried not to yield to competitive pressure, uh, even if it would you know try to point us in a different direction. Yeah, we had uh, Dan Teasdale on the show a couple months ago, and he was talking about just how bizarre it was to be in the halls of Harmonics back in that transition period between Guitar Hero and Rock Band and trying to work on the Skunk Works project that was Rock Band, but keep it secret and hide it. Was that uh, ex like an especially stressful time for the studio? Um, well, as I said, it seems like every month of the last 22 years has been an especially <laughs> stressful time for the studio. But I think it was, I mean, as much as anything else, it was an emotionally uh, stress, uh, like a uh, complex time for the studio because... On the one hand, you know, we loved Guitar Hero. It was our baby, 
Yeah. It, it, you know, and it was not just we loved it because it was our, you know, it was our creation, but we loved it because it was also, you know, after 10 years of being a studio that was like almost out of business, you know, and sort of like surviving on like twigs and bark in the wilderness, right? We fi- like it was finally like the, our breakthrough, right? And 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 it was very dear to our hearts. It felt in a lot of ways like the game we were born to make, and so we loved we loved Guitar Hero. And then at the same time, we were going through a slow motion breakup once Activision bought, you know, Red Octane and that IP. And then we were acquired, you know, by uh, by Viacom and MTV. And we were now making Rock Band, which we also loved. And to us felt like the, na- the, the obvious, logical, natural next step, you know, where to take that experience was to turn it into a group uh, experience. So we were very excited about Rock Band and really pouring ourselves into it. Um but at the same time, we were making a product that was going to then be in direct competition with our baby, you know, that we still, you know, loved. Uh, and so that was like that was not easy terrain emotionally to navigate. You can still have that much attachment to the brand or is it just you just connect it with the sweat that you guys poured out working on those first couple games? Yeah, I mean, uh, both, I would say, you know, we really we felt like a lot of our uh, you know studio DNA was in that brand. But of course, once, you know, once other studios took it over, they started putting their own DNA into that brand and it started evolving in different directions. And then at that point, it was out for us all about making Rock Band like the Harmonix, uh, the Harmonix studio identity title. Yeah. And that feud went on. I mean, feud might be a strong word, but with Guitar Hero Live releasing around the same time as Rock Band 4, in retrospect, what was that new rivalry like for you guys? Uh, well, it's funny because at that point, the experiences, you know, back in the old days, the experiences, there was like a competitive arms race in the like back in the seventh gen. So yeah. the games were pretty similar, right? Like we were adding a lot of similar features and, you know, um, whereas by the time, you know, GH Live came out last fall and Rock Band 4 came out, the experiences had diverged so much that they barely resembled each other anymore. And so at that point, I would say it was actually a lot like less emotionally charged than it had been, you know, back in the heyday. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. I mean, you guys have, if you feel like such an experimental studio, and I feel like you say harmonics, people will say, oh, the rock band studio. Yeah, got it. But you guys have cranked out, I mean, beyond frequency and amplitude and the reboot of amplitude, so many little experiments along the way, like phase in the early <laughs> iPod days and whatnot, or even now on iOS, you know, like Beatniks and Record Run, how important is it to you to keep experiment and experimenting and taking those little stabs in new markets like that? Uh, I think it's pretty deeply woven into uh, you know our, our creative DNA as, as a studio. It you know. First of all, it's uh, creatively invigorating for people at the studio to get uh, you know to experiment with maybe lower stakes, uh, you know, products um, in new areas or on new platforms or with new gameplay. Um, and so on one level, it's creatively invigorating and it, all, it also helps level up people. It gives us insights, uh, you know, about new mechanics that work or don't work or aspects of development on a platform that, you know, that are challenging or, 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 or opportunities. And the other reason, you know, we're motivated to do it is, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, find gold in some of those areas, you know, you, you'll discover a new mechanic that like, damn, okay, this is a tiny title, but this is a, this is a sweetheart game mechanic that we could actually build a, you know, a big budget, a real, uh, a, a real full blown game around. And so it's, I think pretty important for us to, to keep, uh, keep the laboratory open. Yeah. Do you have examples of, you know, when you've struck gold and things that you've carried forward from some of the smaller projects out there? Well, I mean, so let's see. Um, uh, as an example, um, in Rock Band 4, one of the most uh, polarizing um, uh, features in Rock Band 4 was the freestyle guitar uh, system. Um, some people loved it and thought it was the best thing about Rock Band 4. A majority of people, you know, hated it and like turned it off and never turned it back on again. And, um, and if you look at it, if you look at an experiment like the freestyle guitar, and there were a lot of aspects of it that were, you know, that were not quite right, right? Um, so if you look at the freestyle guitar solos simply within the context of the initial like Rock Band 4 release, you could think of that as a, a failed experiment. Here's a feature we put in that like just didn't, didn't appeal to most of the people playing the game. It, it didn't work, right? However, fast forward a, a year or two and 
some of the technology and ideas and learnings from that experiment wove their way into the new gameplay systems in Rock Band uh, VR, oh, interesting. which oh. are in which are really completely different than the way freestyle guitar solos appeared in Rock Band 4, but there were insights that we gained from that experiment that directly enabled uh, you know, the breakthroughs that we made in new gameplay that we created in Rock Band VR. So you know, we view a lot of our failed experiments that way, like, okay, this didn't work, but yeah. what can we take forward? What knowledge or technology can we take forward and apply to you know, the next thing that we do? Were there big takeaway lessons from uh developing chroma co-developing chroma i forget exactly how you'd phrase that but what was the what was the lesson from that experience yeah okay boy we could spend how much time do we have we could oh, spend we got, like hour three hours Alex. That, yeah you know, this was the first person that. shooter musical thing you're working with what was the name of the studio hidden um uh, Hidden Path, yes, a great, a great developer in the in the Seattle area who has, uh, you know, they've done a great stuff. They, they have a uh, game called Defense Grid now, Defense Grid Two, including in VR, which is an excellent title. And they're they're a great, talented group of people. And they had shooter expertise, which is what led us to work out with them on that. That's obviously yeah. not what we do, um, but for example, um, you know, uh, well, God, we could spend a lot of time on this. But one of the things that we um, uh, that we learned when trying to merge some of our music gameplay ideas with some of the core shooter concepts uh, in that game was related to player attention. And particularly in a PvP shooter, um, so much player attention was being devoted to um, uh, targeting and killing opponents and avoiding opponents who are trying to target and kill you, that it left very little mental bandwidth available for some of the more interesting uh, musical uh, music choices and music experiences that we were trying to summon uh, in the player creatively. And we actually learned quite a few lessons about how in our next attack at that problem, kind of merging shooter gameplay with music making uh, gameplay of various sorts, but we actually think we can be quite a bit more successful in the next run that we have at it at the, the right point in time. But again, that was uh, the particular avenue that we pr pursued in V1 didn't pan out the way we hoped, but we learned a lot of stuff that we think will bear fruit the next time we, we have a stab at it. And it's just trying to tap into that Zen flow zone that you guys are known for, but it's just an odd mix with, Twitch mechanics. Uh, yes, or um, it's again, it's it's about um, like which factors are comp competing for player attention and yeah. making sure that player attention is. If if what you want players is to be locked in a musical flow state, you need to make sure that the gameplay is not interfering with the, you know their ability to be settling their attention in that that kind of hypnotic music flow state. So you don't see that as a dead end. You see it as an avenue you guys are still very interested in. It is, although from. Uh, some pretty different approaches than the first ones that we tried in, in, in that initial stab. Okay. And speaking of experiments, do you feel like Rock Band Blitz paved the way for Amplitude to come back? How much of a connection do you see between those two experiences? Oh, I don't know that it paved the way. I would say that what paved the way for Amplitude to come back was crowd financing of games. Yeah. Um, because after, you know, the original Amplitude was not commercially successful, but it had a very, you know, it had a very passionate small audience and, uh, you know, trying to get a publisher to fund a title like that that had, you know, it had critical acclaim but not commercial success is very difficult through traditional uh, financing channels. But if you have a sufficiently passionate fan base, you know, they'll step up and write checks to bring something that they, you know, a title they feel strongly uh, about back to life. And so that was, you know, I was pretty thrilled about that. It's interesting. So it's still a Sony exclusive. Is there, I understand they own the name Amplitude, right? Do they? Also... Uh, they do. That's a Sony IP title. Right, I mean, right. we own like code and technology and stuff like that, but the the brand IP of that is a is a Sony product. And what about those gameplay systems itself? I mean, Rock Band Blitz was in a similar vein, but not identical in that way. Is that also an issue where you can't take that exact gameplay because Sony kind of sort of owns the right to that? No, so, I mean, there was it was very uh, specific to Amplitude and that and that brand IP. In the case of you know Rock Band Blitz, that's its own you know, that's its own brand IP. So not a, not an issue as it relates to the, you know, Amplitude stuff. Okay. Right on. Okay. Uh, yeah. The Kickstarter was so wild with Amplitude. It was incredibly down to the wire. What is it like <laughs> to try and rally the fans? Cause I must, you must've had so many years of people being like Amplitude Frequency, the best games you guys have ever done. Why don't you get back to that? And then be like, Hey, 
we're sending up the flare. Come around. And it's like, okay, we've got a crowd. We need a bigger crowd. What the hell do we do? I cannot imagine yeah, being in those shoes. It was amazing. I mean, our community team at that time, you know, was fantastic. They really pulled out all the stops and trying to rally uh, the industry. I mean, I think a big part of the message was to, to those people who backed early, um, you know, when the thing stalled midway through, the message to them was like, look, if you can't rope in a few of your friends, <laughs> this ain't going to happen. So if you really want, you know, if you really want this to happen, you, you know, you guys are early backers. You're now our sales force to, to bring in the rest. And um, the other thing is we were, we were blessed that some other uh, industry figures like Notch or Ted Price at Insomniac or other figures, they came in as back backers and kind of used their platforms to, you know, help bring in some people. So it was really a, a wonderful kind of communal effort from the industry. Yeah, congratulations on getting the thing out the door. Uh, as a huge fan myself, I had such a blast with it last year. Absolutely adore that. And that's game. great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's so nice to have high score chases again with friends and actually have a leaderboard right there to compare it. Because I've played that Insomniac song so many times now because of course that's the one that's like neck and neck with friends so ted price's yes. beautiful voice is just drilled into my soul <laughs> oh god uh was that a positive experience overall for you uh bringing out oh, the yeah. back yeah i mean look there's you know um there's some projects we pursue because we think like yeah you know what uh we think if we do this game well mi millions of people you know we will respond to this and we could reach an audience of that size. And so there's some projects at that scale. And there are other projects where you're like, look, we'll be, we'll be lucky if a hundred thousand people show up to have this, but we really want it to exist because there are people under this roof right here who, who will love playing this. So if we can just find a way to make the case that we could at least pay the bills, um, you know, and you know, I would say amplitude was that it was a, you know, a, a passion project in that sense. Um, but uh, it's, you know, these things have a way, going back to the earlier theme about kind of lessons and takeaways that you apply to future projects, you know, frequency and amplitude, they were not big sellers, but they, you know, taught harmonics how to make rhythm action games and built, gave us technology and, and insights there. And then we went off and made the Karaoke Revolution series of games, which were all about performers on stage in front of an audience, you know, so we built systems for, you know, animating, you know, musical performers and having interactive crowd systems and those sorts of things. And then subsequently Guitar Hero happened. And while neither Amplitude nor Karaoke Revolution were like big commercial successes, those are the projects that gave us the expertise and the technology base such that at the right moment in time, we could make Guitar Hero. Yeah. And so we try to view every one of those projects that way. So like even something like the Amplitude Kickstarter, you know, I don't think anyone had illusions that that was going to like be a huge hit, but it strengthened our technology base. It strengthened the ex expertise of people at the studios in certain ways that will always carry forward into future projects. And also just, it's got to be a good lesson just for communicating with the community. I mean, you guys posted yeah. a lot of like, early videos of, you know, the creative director just at his desk showing the prototype version of the game and stuff like that. So it's going to be nice to yeah. kind of tear down that barrier a little bit. Yes. And I, it's something I think we want to get better at over time as well. Yeah, for sure. So throughout Harmonix's run so far, what do you think is the most underappreciated project? What are you most proud of that you think deserves more attention? Oh, you know, it's funny. If you had asked me that question a year or two ago, um, I would have said Amplitude, you yeah. know, the original Amplitude. And in fact, the reason we felt so strongly about rebooting Amplitude and bringing it back is that, you know, I thought, damn, like, that was a good game, possibly our best game from a pure music gameplay standpoint. That was a good game. Like, it's sad that it never really, you know, found its audience back in the day. We got to find a way to bring that back so we can, you know, publish it digitally at a lower price point and maybe, uh, you know, find, our, find a bigger audience with it. So, you know, I think that would have been my answer at this point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think most of our best games have found have found their audience. Um, you know, it's funny. We're you know, Harmonix is best known for for uh, rock band and before that, Guitar Hero. But actually, Dance Central was one of our biggest hits. It was a big deal for our studio for several years, and that's that's a, a game, and I'm really proud of that series. I love playing it. Um, and so during its run from like 2010 through 2012, it was uh, it was you know the heartbeat of the studio. Yeah, really wild stuff. There must have been discussions in the studio of giving Dan Central the the Beatles rock band treatment, right? And actually trying to partner with a, a larger brand to to help that thing out. There were we definitely had those conversations. We never quite found the right fit at the right time, but uh, certainly it was a topic of discussion. Yeah. Did you see the Just Dance uh, 
series as your rivals back then? Was it a little bit of rekindling that old Guitar Hero rock band rivalry? Oh yeah, absolutely. There were some there were some parallels there for sure. I yeah. mean, not quite in that we hadn't never been involved with Just Dance, so it didn't have that like common family tree aspect. But it was like two big franchises duking it out in a you know in, in a focused category. Um, and uh, that was especially true when they, you know, they started out on the Wii and we were on ex- Connect exclusively. But when they eventually came to Connect, that was especially true. Yeah, I'd imagine. And so Dance Central must have really paved the way then for Fantasia. It did. We got really uh, sucked into motion gaming as an interesting new, you know, motion control and engaging the player's entire body in gameplay suddenly went, you know, became a feasible thing with the Connect. And so that was... Uh, that way, you know, Dance Central absolutely was the path into uh, the Fantasia project. You asked earlier about, you know, uh, under uh, less well-known or underappreciated projects at Harmonix. You know, the Fantasia game is one that not a lot of people have played. It was not a big commercial success. Um, you know, and I don't think it's our strongest game from a gameplay standpoint, but there are moments in that game musically and visually that are actually quite special. So uh, anyone who is, you know, on the hunt for, you know, a music gameplay experience that they maybe haven't had before. That was maybe one worth picking up and checking out. There's some special moments in it. Absolutely. And you look back on it, it is so bizarre. It is so, some would say artsy fartsy. Just to have yeah, yeah. this experiential game given that budget and have Disney backing it so much, especially when in that era, Disney was really pruning around the edges. And it seems like somehow Fantasia the game that should not have made it through that process as far as feasibility possibly like you guys delivered it it released people enjoyed it how did fantasia of all projects one of the more bizarre as far as placing money on a sure thing how did that survive that disney culling um i you know i think in some ways it's uh you know it's a testament to the strength of the original brand yeah um you know, there's there's something about the original Fantasia film, you know, which is like, look, it's a really f- actually flawed film, I think, in a lot of ways. But there was something really special about it. And um, it, it has a very, you know, a, it has a very uh, kind of positive aura in culture, even for people who, who don't even remember it that well. It sort of like just has this positive brand aura that at which, you know, Disney had validated with a lot of research that I think um, lent them some confidence that. Um, it was at least a brand that deserved a modern interactive treatment as a kind of extension of the, you know, the Disney canon. And I, I think that's one of the reasons that there were a lot of people in that organization who were, who were fiercely committed to it. It's awesome. I mean, you look at like Disney's history, like I forget if it's third or fourth feature film, like it's so early in Walt Disney's filmmaking career and it's so yeah. bold and different. And it's amazing that people within Disney who have to crunch numbers can at least have faith in that. Like, yeah let's make an interactive version of it. Let's be as bold and as different and push this thing through. It's, it's still mind boggling and awesome to me. (laughs) Another crazy period and crazy project. And one, you know, one we're, we're proud of. Yeah, I'd imagine. Uh, So just to dive in deep with, I think one of my favorite games you guys have, have cranked out. I love frequency and amplitude a lot, but Beatles rock band. I feel like it's another one that people don't give enough attention to as far as I'd imagine what a nightmare would be trying to, get the rights and put that thing together. People kind of take it for granted that like, of course there's a Beatles video game, but what was that like to actually will that thing into existence? It was a, it was a a really extended courtship. As you might imagine, there are many constituents, many rights holders, a lot of opinions. It's a complicated, you know, it's, it's the Beatles, right? So, but it all started in a good place, which is that, um, uh, George Harrison's son, Danny Harrison, wonderful chap, um, uh, became a Guitar Hero fan. And uh, the president of MTV, a uh, great guy, wonderful man named Van Toffler, was a friend of Danny Harrison's. And, the, you know, MTV had just bought us. And the two of them were talking. I think they were on like an island in the Caribbean somewhere hanging out. And, um, you know, uh, Danny Harrison mentioned to Van Toffler at MTV that he was like, a, you know, he was playing a lot of Guitar Hero. And Van said, well, we just bought the company that made Guitar Hero. So Van put us together. And then Danny and I just got to talking and, uh, you know, and, you know, he got to playing rock band and thought, you know, so the conversation started right there. Like, oh, my God, what about, you know, imagine a version of this dedicated to the Beatles music. And that began a, 
a long courtship of ideation, introductions to all the constituents um, uh, in the Beatles world, and of course in the you know the record company and music publishing world who, who owned all the relevant rights as well, and it took about a year to pull it all together. But in the end, they were all psyched, and in fact, you know, it wasn't one of these. Despite the number of parties involved, it wasn't a contentious project. They were so supportive every step of the way. They made material creative contributions. It wasn't just like a creative sign-off thing. I mean, they were really like pouring themselves into helping helping us make, you know, doing some of our best work. And I do think in some ways, you know, it was it was not nearly the most commercially successful rock band title, um, but it is, you know, when I when I played that game to the end as a consumer. And, and, and finish the final cutscene, you know, watch that last cutscene at the end and just like reflected on the experience I had had playing the Beatles rock band, you know, from beginning to end. I, it, it was the, the work that I was most proud of that the studio had done, you know, at that point in our history. I always argue it's still the best documentary video game ever made. When it comes to that niche genre, like, I don't know if anybody can ever top Beatles rock band. It's so amazing. And so... Uh, I- Development. I, I actually we release it on on nine nine oh nine and on September 9th every single year I boot it back up again and play the whole game from the beginning. <laughs> That's perfect. So development itself wasn't you know touch and go, but the series of hail marys just had to happen in terms of introductions and hoping along the way the thing will eventually start rolling downhill in a good way. So. During that time, were you just bubbling? Are you just walking down the street thinking like there's no way this can possibly come together and happen? I had no idea. I mean, it seemed like an extreme long shot, but it also seemed like something that so clearly should happen that I just had faith that one way or another it would. And there was enough positive engagement that like even, you know, like our first demo to Paul McCartney of like with Beatles music in the game, you know, I was incredibly nervous walking into that meeting. I usually don't get nervous in like game pitches, but you know, it's freaking Paul McCartney. So I was a little nervous. And, uh, and I clearly remember like, uh, you know, after that demo, he, he was like, uh, you know, (laughs) it's amazing moment. Actually. He's like, yeah, don't, don't be nervous. It's all good. And, And they actually, he like, he gave me this sprig of Lavender, he said, I just cut this from my garden this morning. I try to bring lavender around with me and, uh, you know, just uh, the scent of it calms me and helps me deal with like the stress of the city or whatever. And he gave that to sort of calm me down in the presentation of the game. It was like this incredibly kind, generous gesture that set the tone for the relationship, actually, with the the group of them going forward. And mind you, they were not... um, they were not easy clients. They were holding us to a very high creative standard as they should have. So it was not an easy project, but it felt like a project where everyone was rowing in the same direction. So it was great. And now you've covered all of harmonics with lavender. That's just a constant smell going through the entire studio. Uh, no, but I do still have that, those sprigs of lavender, like in a little bag in my, <laughs> in my cabinet. It's like totem for that project. Uh, because I'm a colossal dork, actually not too long ago, I went back and watched the E3 stage debut where yeah. uh, Ringo and Paul McCartney walked out. That was a bit of a cluster F <laughs> upon rewatching it. Was, it. it was, uh, that was, you know, it was all improvised, you know, like, yeah, was totally. not, it was just like, well, they're going to show up here. They come. And then, you know, um, Boy, I it was hope a, they a bit of a, you know, alien world probably for them going to a video conference and a bit of alien for, you know, video game people to have, you know, the Beatles show up on the stage. Um, but still, uh, you know, a, a real high moment for us. Yeah. Okay. A couple specifics for that game. I would love to get your feedback on, uh, first one, the intro cutscene. Mm-hmm. Was that done in house? How the hell, where was that put together? It is incredible. It is both the intro cutscene and the outro, the ending, you know, cutscene were produced by this wonderful, uh, uh, studio and I think they're based in uh, in England. Well, they may have U.S. offices, but called Passion Pictures, and they uh, um, they're great. They do tremendous creative work, and that's why we sought them out because we thought like those were those were cutscenes that we were going to have to get right and that were going to have to be interesting. And they I think delivered. Yeah. Okay. Then the other thing is just on the documentary front, whose idea was it, or how did it come about? The idea of including, uh, you know, rare footage and video footage pictures and then on top of that also just having being able to hear their actual banter from the raw recordings ah well so uh the the banter that i think came from uh giles martin uh you know sir george martin's uh son who was you know our partner on the project for all of the studio work we were doing in abbey road and when he was pulling up the sessions 
there it was. There was that banter. And I think when we were all sitting there in the studio listening to it, it was like, God, this has got, we have to let people hear this. Um, a, a lot of that, the, the old photographs and whatnot, I mean, Apple Corps has a lot of that stuff. But some of those conversations started, um, the creative lead on the project, a uh, wonderful guy named uh, Josh Randall, um, he went up early on in the project to visit um, uh, Olivia Harrison at, at the, at the you know, George's old uh, uh, you know, estate in England. And she was just very kind to like welcome him into the, her home and started pulling out photo albums and showing him old family pictures of George Harrison and the family and the, from those days. And the experience of going through those albums and looking at those uh, pictures, it was just so entrancing that I think Josh early on was like, okay, God, we get, we got to get some of this stuff in, into the game for people. Oh, that's amazing. And then when Destiny started rolling out Paul McCartney to promote the game, you guys must have just been leaning back and like, we were there first. Come on. Come on, uh, yeah. Bungie. What well, are you funny doing? thing is, so he's, I mean, you know, Paul is a, you know, he's a machine. He still tours to this day and he's still, still a great player and is out there playing all the time. And he still plays uh, the cutscenes from the game on the giant video wall behind him on stage as part of his show. And really? so that is, that's pretty heartwarming. Oh my God. I had no idea. That's amazing. So you mentioned that there's always, you know, a level of managed chaos for running a studio like Harmonics. But do you ever get those moments where you just get to sit back and rethink much in the same way you did for Rock Band VR? Just what is Harmonics? What are music games? What avenues have not been touched on yet? Yeah, well, I would I mean, there are always big milestone markers for the studio, which are usually at the end of major projects. I mean, minor projects happen more frequently, but well, if, we, if we do a, a you know, giant you know, year or two long project that involves like large team of like dozens of people, there's a moment at the end of that where everyone just kind of collapses in a heap. Um, because once you're in a big production like that, it's hard to be thinking about reinvention. You have to be thinking about execution. There's a well-articulated vision for this title. We've locked the core gameplay, the production scope, blah, blah, blah. It's like, go, let's like build this thing and polish the crap out of it and just like make it beautiful and whatever. But there's not like, usually not a lot of, hopefully there's not a lot of reinvention going along, uh, you know, along the way, because that's hard when, you know, you're running a giant team on a big project, right? It's dangerous, it's expensive, it's chaotic, et cetera. So there's ideally when things are running well, there's, there shouldn't be a lot of second guessing going on during those big productions. But then you finish them and you ship them and there's a, mo there's a moment of pause where you have to reflect, rest, and think about what we learned. Whether we feel it was a successful project or a failed project or somewhere in between, what are the lessons we can take forward? Also, what's happening in the outside world that has changed? Where is the puck headed? Like what, what, lessons can we learn from you know the best and worst of what we've just done in the past year that we should be feeding in, into the next project so i would say that at least once a year there's a pretty you know there's like deep navel gazing about like what the next one to five years of music gaming should be and what yeah. our role is going to be in, in bringing that into being and the easy answer from the outside is oh you guys can just look at the most popular genres and then attach a music angle to it so it's like musical moba i mean that's got to be coming up soon right uh, yeah, it's of course we, we we do the exact that exact thing. We look at other genres and we think, okay, what ways could we inject music gameplay into that genre to take the best elements of that genre and give it something new? Um, it's uh, you know it's one way of thinking about the problem, but it's pretty challenging from a competitive standpoint because you know, for example, let's just take your example of the music MOBA. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, let's take a MOBA and add a musical twist to it in terms of music creation mechanics or things of that sort. That sounds pretty appealing. It's something we've specifically talked about on a number of occasions. And then you bring that to market and you're going to be competing with, you know, League, Dota, now, you know, Paragon, giant, successful, huge budget titles with tens, hundreds of millions of dollars poured into them in some cases in terms of feature set and scope and infrastructure and ecosystem, fiercely committed fans, uh, you know, devoted fans to those. So now you're going to be entering a category to compete because you have like a new music hook on your title. It's a very steep proposition. Like what you're bringing to the category has to be so strong. It can't be like, oh, we make the game 20% better because there's an interactive music element. It has to be like, 200 times better if what you're going to do is unseat 
an established titan in a mature in a mature genre. So um, that is it's absolutely one of the lenses through which we look at the future of music games is how can we hybridize with other well-established genres. But another lens is like what genres don't yet exist that should that we could build new play paradigms around new, you know around music with. Yeah, and imagine that's more in the Fantasia realm where it's hey, let's have a interactive musical experience. How about that for a genre? And then it's just a really tough thing to drive home as far as messaging goes. That's right. So the the benefit is well, you don't have entrenched competitors. The drawback is what the hell have you made and how do you you know, how do you communicate that to the world? And that was absolutely one of our challenges with Fantasia when there isn't when there isn't a clear when you can't describe what it is in a sentence you have a marketing problem. Right. Yeah, I can definitely see that. So this is maybe too abstract and stupid, but I find myself thinking a lot about why don't games really have the equivalent of a musical, like a Hollywood musical? Obviously, La La Land, everyone's losing their minds about recently, but is there any way to combine that more for a musical narrative-based journey? I understand there's kind of some abstract narrative happening in the new amplitude even, but is that a concept you think about? It sure is. Yeah, you can imagine the, the role of uh, narrative, uh, you know, narrative arcs, character development, these aspects that are, um, you know, central in a lot of other games, but which haven't really been explored in the music genre. You know, how to do that well with music gameplay is something that, you know, it's one of our recurring conversations. So part of the conversation is about the wrapper around music gameplay. And narrative is a, you know, and, and the role of narrative and character is an important part of that conversation. Another is just, of course, core gameplay mechanics. And, um, you know, one of the challenges with music games, uh, if you look back at the last 20 years of music games, is that by and large, the heartbeat of the genre has been rhythm action gameplay. Um, here's a stream of, of instructions which you must execute. You know, we will prescribe your exact sequence of gameplay actions and score you based upon your ability to do so. And there's a reason that that has been the heart of music gameplay, which is it's fun. It's fun and it has sustained the genre for a couple of decades now. So that's great. And we, you know, obviously we've made tons of those games and we will probably continue making a bunch of rhythm action games. However, that the prescriptiveness of pure rhythm action games is is severe and it's, it limits the genres in a, in a lot of ways, not the least of which is that if the game is play, being played extremely well, every game is the same. Right. You know, I, if I watch 10 experts, you know, play, you know, through the fire and flame, the, the, the result is identical. And, you know, compare that to a game like League of Legends, where when you watch like experts playing, every game unfolds differently. And the interest of that variation is like what makes those games fun to watch and to play over and over again. So a theme, and as we think about core gameplay mechanics at Harmonix, one of the key themes uh, we grapple with is this notion of musical agency, that uh, creating music games where every game unfolds differently, where players make choices that have gameplay consequences and musical consequences, and that they are, are making every, every musical performance their own um, through the gameplay framework that they're operating in. And you're seeing that, that is a, it's a central aspect of Rock Band VR, uh, it's an important aspect of Sing Space, actually, which, you know, it's a it's a singing game for VR. Unlike our prior singing games that just score you based upon your ability to sing the exact pitch that we prescribe for you, this is going to be a game that is much more social and is about uh, entertaining performances as, you know, as judged by your peers. Um, so again, and, and then, there, you know, we'll have some uh, new projects we'll be announcing soon that, uh, you know, completely different music gameplay, but again, is all about uh, giving players uh, musical agency, creative agency, gameplay agency, such that every game unfolds differently. And I think um, that when we get that just right, uh, hopefully we will give birth to a kind of a whole new chapter in the evolution of the music gameplay genre, where the uh, the diversity and opportunity for surprises um, exists in a way that has never really been there before in music games because of the pres prescriptiveness of rhythm action. Yeah, it's so tough. Like I remember Sid Meier in his classic quote about games being a uh, series of interesting decisions. And then he, I think, uh, updated that by saying, well, but Guitar Hero and Rock Band are fun and that's the exact opposite. So maybe it's not true. But it makes me think of also like Naughty Dog's concept of 
wide linear gameplay is the way they frame it. And so that's more of the ballpark where there's wiggle room, but there's still a path that will eventually end up in a positive or negative, you know, verdict for the player. Yeah. I mean, there are many approaches to this gnarly problem that I just touched on. I mean, I think one of the challenges, you know, Sid, Sid made that generalization about games and then he quickly noticed the the inconsistencies. And I think one of the great challenges with with games as a a medium and treating it as a medium is that the diversity of the medium is greater than any other medium. I mean, think of film. Obviously, film. There's a lot of different kinds of movies, like a, an enormously diverse range of artistic and entertainment experiences you can create in film, right? But compare uh, a mobile game like Threes one of my favorite games of the last few years, to Uncharted. Those are both games and are sort of treated as like existing in the same medium, but they could have, you know, it's hard to imagine two, you know, uh, entertainment experiences having less to do with each other and still, you know, being, you know, falling under the same uh, umbrella. And so I think that, you know, one of the challenges with um, creating those kinds of generalizations about what a game is or what makes a game good is that the answer, there is no single right right answer to that question because of the diversity of the, the medium. Yeah. Here's a here's a specific pinpoint thing. Uh, is there any chance you played Rayman Legends? Oh, uh, the the are you referring to the music gameplay that it's some of the most it? satisfying music gameplay I've had in a long time is playing through yep. the just absurd covers where you're platforming along the way. That must have been especially fascinating to you if you saw it or played it yourself. Oh yeah, you know, so it was a uh, it was a great uh, example. I think of an alternative take, and we try to consume as much of that as we can to inform our own, you know, imaginations. Okay, right on. Uh, so, just in broad terms, what does the future of harmonics look like? Do you want to swing big and focus your effort? Is it just going to be a series of smaller experiments forever, or what does it look like for you? Um, well, I mean, certainly there will be, you know, if you look at the period leading up to Guitar Hero, it was a series of small experiments until we found the right thing. And then we chased a, an idea, you know, uh, of rock performance simulation. We chased it really hard for many years, right? Uh, and it had its, 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 you know, its heyday, and it's still an important business for us. I mean, as you can see, we're still like exploring that concept in new ways with Rock Band VR and whatnot. But uh, a time came where it was time to think about other things. So I would say we're, we're certainly in a phase now where we are going to be undertaking a series of smaller experiments until we find that next big thing. And, you know, I do feel like we have some projects coming up, you know, that we'll be announcing relatively soon that are a glimmer of some, uh, a completely different approach to a notion of what a music game is, completely different notion of, uh, of what music game gameplay is. And, have an opportunity to become, you know, something much bigger than just a, you know, a game title. So just to understand the way you're framing this. So you're saying the announcements coming up soon are going to be step one for the stepping stone path to a bit of a revolution for the music genre. Uh, yeah, I would hopefully uh, more than a step, hopefully a, a leap. <laughs> okay, right on. Well, I'm endlessly fascinated by Harmonix's history uh, and your future. So I'm really curious to see what you guys crank out in the future there. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks thanks for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Alex. And thank you for watching or listening to this episode of The Game Informer Show. Be sure to tune in next Thursday, and we'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Bye.